Coast. Ms. Rufia Katawana. Welcome, Kyla. Hello, welcome. Welcome. Now you've been here all day. Welcome to me. 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 Welcome to have submitted last year, we were quite strong about how we wanted the new marketing agency to work. Obviously, we have a vested interest in ensuring that the way that we deliver that compelling destination message that is written within the economic development strategy, we have a vested interest in ensuring that it's a marketing promise that we can meet. It's a marketing promise that is one that we can tie into and pin our coattails to uh, in a lot of ways, but it's also one that represents what we think and feel Dunedin should be. Um, represented in the international and dom domestic arena, we uh, we are aware that um, the, you know the new agency will be in house, and we're committed to working with the new agency. But I guess it's just we were quite firm in wanting to put a submission through for this year to talk about the fact that we want to try and ensure that we've got a we don't want to lose traction. And I think when I look at how Dunedin was placed four years ago when I first moved back to Dunedin, um, it's, it, we have lost traction within the tourism industry just a little. Uh, when we look at things like um, not so much from destination numbers or from, uh, from a, um, even from the respect of the visitors that are coming, but very much so from how many businesses are going through Quelma, for example. Uh, that's dropped from 60 to 49. Now that either highlights the fact that uh, Qualmark isn't doing its job or we aren't doing our job to, I guess, highlight the importance of being involved in some of those marketing strategies. So we want to ensure that this new marketing agency has funding ring-fenced for tourism, that they're actually going to continue to market our city the way that we hope and, and can input into the process to market our city, because we are delivering that promise to a lot of people who walk through our doors. Um, we see great benefit in, autonom in an autonomous board. Um, my background, and I've spent 15 years in destination marketing and a lot of that at the government level with Tourism New Zealand, and a lot of what I've seen with the regions who have an internal facing um, marketing agency, one that is housed within council, it, it does struggle to be proactive and reactive and it does struggle to be able to I guess meet the demands of what we need to be able to meet to, to drive economic um, injection into the city. It's one of the things that, you know, I mean, destination marketing, particularly for a region like ours, it's, it's vital. Um, I've seen regions in the past where funding has been decreased to market a, market a destination or a regional tourism organisation has been disbanded. Um, and you know, created into a or formed into another function. For example, um, in the Waikato, uh, they disbanded the tourism aspect of it completely. Um, and then again, in the um, in the Wanganui area, they actually tied it all together with the eyesight. In both cases, you saw businesses going under. You saw visitor numbers dropping off. You saw the look and the feel of of how those those regions were being picked up internationally and domestically drop away. And I guess we want to make sure as an industry board and as, a, as an industry association that we've actually got and maintain some momentum and bring some of that momentum back. And I know it's there because I've seen it in the own business, my own business that I'm, well, in Cadbury's business that I manage for them. There is growth, there is opportunity. There's $24 billion um, can be attributed to the tourism industry last year and that is expected to grow to $41 billion in 2025. So, We've got a lot of opportunity and we just want to make sure that the agency that's, that's driving that for the city is actually engaging with us to ensure we can um, tap into a little bit more of that $41 billion. And one of our, um, the, the final issue I just wanted to, to bring up, which is in the submission as well, is that there is a difference between destination management and destination marketing. Um, and <laughs> I think what we have done as a city uh, for very well in the past is destination management. Um, but what we haven't necessarily done as well as we could have is in the destination marketing arena. When we're talking about destination marketing, you're wanting to drive awareness, push intention, create preference, and then create conversion. And we want to make sure that the agency understands it's very clear and distinct 
those are two different um, aspects to the same thing, absolutely, but one, you can't have one stronger than the other, otherwise we will lose momentum and we will lose impetus. So I guess that's all the, the, the points I wanted to make today. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Questions? Councillor Kelly. We've heard from several people that ring fencing tourism would be a, a good thought. Is the thought behind that partly that somehow its funding would be able to increase when we haven't got any money the way other people's wouldn't? Or when you say ring fenced, yes. um, I, I think it, I think that point is along the lines of is that we don't, um, you know, we obviously don't have a lot of money. That, that you know that's fairly understandable. But it's it's about saying we don't want to lose what little money that that has been able to be put into marketing the city when you move forward with the new marketing agency, because when you've got an operator, or oh, sorry, when you've got a agency which might have multiple mandates to include, so to market to a multiple different um, type of visitor to Dunedin, whether it be education, whether it be visitor attractions, visitor, whether it be to drive investment, um, the message can be the same, but sometimes if you're focusing in one area, it might detract from the other. And what we don't want to do is lose visitor numbers because we're concentrating in one other area, for instance. So you're happy that ring fencing might mean that you get no increase next year from last year, it's just n neither is anyone else. I just don't want to go backwards. Is that's all I'm saying. <laughs> if we can go forward, absolutely, then, you know, jump over the moon, I think it's a fantastic idea. I think tourism is a great enabler. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. Um, kia ora, Kylie. Kia ora. Uh, you note um, that you see as very important the new agency's short and long-term KPIs, and yes. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm just wondering as to what you think that should look like. Tourism to Dean was largely focused on um, visitor nights, which is problematic for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder whether Dunedin Host are interested in continuing that kind of metric or whether that there are other things that we should be looking at. What kinds of uh, KPIs do you think this new agency should be looking at, particularly reference to tourism? I think, I mean, visitor nights and visitor spend are quite quantifiable. You can look at that and go, oh, look. You know, I've got an extra night stay or I've got an extra um, $20 out of every person who's coming. But there are, we need to understand, are we driving visitor satisfaction? That should be a metric. Other people who are coming here are satisfied with, the, with what we're delivering as an operation. I, and I, I think that as a marketing agency, if you can track what that visitor attraction is, then you know whether you're actually delivering the marketing promise that you're out there saying. So if your awareness key and what you're talking about to the people who are, who are looking to Dunedin as a, either a regional or international destination, um, that if you know that you're ringing their bell and ticking their boxes, then you know that you're on the right track. So I don't think necessarily that visitor nights and visitor spend are the only metrics that we should be looking at from a KPI perspective, but I do think that we should be looking more to what how Dunedin is perceived and the messages that um, people, I guess, garner when they have either been here or are looking to come here. And there are ways that you can do that. And I know in our business we track our satisfaction all the time because it's the only way we can really see whether our marketing dollar is actually delivering what we need it to deliver. Would your membership be interested, do you think, in helping us to capture that more qualitative data, if you like? You would have to do it through the industry. I think this is in terms of being able to speak to the right people, unless you had the, the type of money like Tourism New Zealand does to just ask anybody who happens to be walking through the airport whether they're here for visitors, holidays or business. Um, so you would need to, to, to ask the industry. And I think uh, one of the things that I've noticed since I've been here is that there are a lack, there is a lack of research available um, in the, the, you know, for us to know how we are actually doing in that respect. Um, I know how we are doing in Cadbury's res and from a Cadbury perspective, and I wave the flag for research whenever anyone is um, willing to sit down and listen to me. Um, so I think the members would be very happy to be involved, um, as long as we've got a consistent questionnaire to actually ask. Thanks. Councillor Thompson. Well, one, of, one of the things that we're very good at in New Zealand is um, when something's not going quite as we'd like, is to quickly and easily identify that it's the other bloke's fault. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, it seems to me that quite a lot of submissions in, around this particular issue are setting us, I don't mean deliberately, yep. but are, are, are risk setting us up for exactly that kind of thing. 
um, had this been put in place just before the global recession, we would probably be getting a whole lot of submitters coming along and saying that ever since they started this new marketing arrangement, the arse has fallen out of yep. tourism and it's all your fault. <laughs> so it seems to me in terms of our relationships going forward that it's really important that we um, put in place things that will, re that, that will reduce that kind of problem. And I'm wondering if you've got any thoughts around from a process perspective, how we reduce that. So if things go if things go up or things go down, we're able to see past the the easy blame game kind yep. of thing. I think it's I think one of the things that um, Whatever the structure looks like, whoever, whoever ends up being in the role, the, the, the issue and the, the breakdown that I have seen is the communication side of things. Um, not being able to uh, input or have uh, a chance to actually talk about what or how we as an industry see that compelling message and, that, and, and putting that forward. I mean, one of the things that um, we'd we'd love to, to, to see is something that we can actually all come together and... and put our messages behind, a consistent message. One of the things that what I've talked about at certain meetings and at certain times through, through the four years that I've been here and two years within the Dunedin Host Board is that there's no story behind the brand. There has, there has to be a story behind the brand. There has to be a way for us to tell Dunedin's story in a way that becomes uh, compelling for people to come back and send others. Because um, if we don't, then, we, then we're missing the track. I know that the way that we, in terms of Cadbury, market our business and the way that, way that Cadbury World markets ourselves as a tourism operator, I know that's working because I've seen it um, in black and white. So I think it's it's about trying to ensure that the messages that we're doing um, isn't trying to play the blame game, but it's about opening that communication, ensuring those bridges that have been burnt, and there have been a few, um, are rebuilt. And we all have the opportunity to sit around a table and talk about what is our compelling destination message and putting that out forward um, and not have it just be seen that Dunedin's a great cruise ship destination, which is what it states in the economic development strategy. So that, that all makes perfect sense to me, but I suppose it also begs the question of what's got in the way. You, you just said that we don't have, have it now. No. So what's got in the way of that happening up till now that we might be able to avoid going forward. Yeah, I think what's got in the way is the lack of communication and lack of being able to feed into the process. I also think it's around, um, we have, there was a lot of work done on a, on a brand, but not much done on the brand story that supports it. Um, I think there's a lot of um, opportunity that we have to We've got a lot of great, great businesses and great minds in the tourism uh, in Dunedin to actually come together and, and build a brand story. If all you've got is a brand that sits out there with nothing substantial to sit behind it and you can't articulate it, then you've got an issue. And I think that's one of the, the barriers that has been in place for us, um, especially for us as a, as a tourism industry. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, no, thank you. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing dialogue. Absolutely. Councillor McTavish. I've just been looking online to see whether I can find out, but um, in terms of the total number of tourism operators in Dunedin, mm -hmm. what proportion of those are your members? So do you represent the, the industry in total, or is it a portion of...? Um, it's, it's, it's a membership. We have over 80 members. Um, within uh, our membership um, and they, we have representatives across transport, accommodation and obviously attractions um, and I think we're a good um, representation of what uh, the industry in Dunedin has um, but when we, when, we, when we go out and we talk to our members it is to those 80. Um, having said that, there are non-members who we quite often are engaged with whether that be through packaging or just general tourism conversations as well. Thank you. Any questions? Kia ora, Thank you for your submission. Mr. Clearwater. Welcome. The next five minutes is yours. I won't take that long. Um, my name is Steve Clearwater, I'm a farmer, contractor and quarry owner and I live and work in the Portobello, Portobello Peninsula area. 
and I've done so all my life. Uh, my submission is about the order of events for the safety improvements on the Portobello roading network. Um, I'd like to applaud the DCC for starters, what they've done the last few years uh, for their progress to date. And uh, it's the staging of the work that's proposed, it's the key thing. Um, you really got to stick with that current plan. I mean, this was decided years and years ago, lots of consultation, lots of meetings, a lot of times got into it. Um, it was pretty obvious that it was a safety improvement thing that was going to benefit the communities. And, and that was always the priority. Where the cycleway things come from, everyone seems to call it the cycleway, but that was never the intention. It was always the safety improvement program. Um, the community benefits of the schools and the residents far outweigh any perceived benefit the cyclists will receive. Um, I drive trucks every day on this road, and the most dangerous sections are the Harrington Point Road, which is obviously being sorted out very soon, and the order can't change with that. And then the Portobello to Broad Bay section, which is a contentious issue. Um, I would urge you to strongly stick with the current plan that is in place. This section of road has two very tight blind corners, and when towing a trailer, uh, a lot of guts is really needed to commit to these corners. Um, and that you always cross your fingers that there's no tour bus coming, because it's just tough luck if there is, really. Um, it's amazed me there's never been another major crash there. Um, I challenge any of you, if you want to get in a mini bus and follow me in these sections of road, that's the key thing. This section of road, you just can't drive a truck and trailer, especially a semi or transporter trailer. You've just got to go around the wrong side of the road. Now that to me screams out that it's the worst section and therefore it should be the priority to fix. Um, the road from Mac Bay to town is, is adequate. It's, it's a reasonable road. Uh, for most trucks, trailers, they can all navigate it, no issues, but you get to that Portobello section and you're in trouble. You know. um, we're currently carting 2,000 tonnes of logs from Hoover's Inlet over there, so it's a good opportunity if you want to follow us, get in behind. Um, I do hope also that when the voting comes, that councillors that will directly benefit from this decision, and I'm perfectly referring to uh, the Mayor and the Z, both being cyclists, and they both live in the Mac Bay section, and I feel that they've got no real affinity with the Portobello Broad Bay section of road, so they should opt out. Really, and why this whole round of consultation is even taking place? I mean, I understand you had about four submissions and a few verbals, um, and it started this whole raft posting out. Um, it's just a big fat waste of money. I thought it was decided years and years ago what the order of events were, and it's um, I feel that someone's railroading it and trying to push it through. Um, thank you. Well, maybe I should kick off the questions to seek some clarity on your written submission about what you were referring to when you referred to pleasing me, because I don't understand what you're saying. So well, perhaps if you could explain the order of events has changed to get the Mac Bay to town section going ahead over and above Portobello, you live directly in the middle of that, you cycle to work regularly, and you stand to benefit before anyone in Portobello gets their road widened. So you're assuming that you know already what my preference will be. Are you? I've, got a, I've got a good feeling if you live there and cycle regularly. Yeah, yeah but you don't. You know. Councillor Wilson. Um, I, there are a number of submissions about this, um, and uh, some of the submissions are actually that we uh, progress the project quicker um, and maybe at multi sites. Sure. Um, I'm in interested in your knowledge as a truck driver and as quarry owner um, because, so I'm going to ask several questions if that's all right. The first one is that uh, there's a submission that suggests that there's six, uh, almost seven hectares of um, quite deep, uh, uh, quantum-wise I haven't worked it out, yeah. of um, reclamation to be done. Yeah. My understanding is that that will increase truck movement substantially along that road. <coughs> and well, truck, trucks only travel on that road for a reason. And, the, the, you know, and I finish the question and then you may not be yeah. prejudging what I'm going to ask. Sure. Um, the, the, the safety issues depending on where that quarry or the, where that fill comes from. And I'm one of the questions when my, uh, Mike and I so, myself went out there was where the, 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 the fill will come from. And do you know from your quarry experience whether that fill is likely to come from Dunedin End or from the peninsula itself? It'll all come down to price. Um, the Portobello Broad Bay section is, of course, far closer to my quarry. It's probably 6, 7k. Mm -hmm. So it's a likelihood that if I can produce the right price, that yes, the rock will all come from that, from my quarry. Okay. The, um, 
the other question I had is where do you live? Because it's not you don't give that detail in. I live in Papua New Inlet. Papua New Inlet, yep, thank you. Which is 5k from Portobello. Um, what, how would you feel as a ratepayer in that area if we were to increase the speed of the work that was a targeted rate in order to do that rather than a general rate increase throughout the city? Obviously some areas will benefit from this work substantially more, as you've said you will, um, than others. That was never really proposed to be a targeted rate. No, and it's that. just in light of people asking for it to be sped up, we're looking at all options. Mm -hmm. So that, and it's not about what we have no, no. now. If, if we were to speed it up, and I think there's a general agreement that the project is a long-term one. If we were to speed it up, no, I don't think any rates increases or any targeted rates will be answered. So you had the current plan, and it made a lot of sense. So you're happy for it to be a 10-year project? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Well, I was going to say something I'd later regret by responding to an idiotic written comment, but I won't. <laughs> um, but um, just in light of the fact that. Um, you have a quarry down the other end. Do you think that uh, you might have something to benefit? Oh, I absolutely do, and I benefit right. from the so other end. So you don't, you don't think you should sit back? Well, <laughs> take it in light, you know. I'm trying to support the community, so you didn't say not many people have actually come forward with a lot of this chance to stand up and talk about it. Um, we've already taken a lot of rock right through to the voxel end, so we're going to get something out of it anyway. You know. And your your written comment you feel really helps your cause. Uh, was that about the meeting? Yeah, well, at the meeting we had Portobello, he's the one that said that he cycles regularly, he's the one that fell off in the dark. You didn't say which boxes. You didn't say those doesn't use Oh, maybe he does use our section. All right, are there any further questions? Thank you for your submission. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, Mr. Thompson, or spokes to me. Well, Robert, thank you very much. Uh, just like to pass around a little bit of additional information that I've since acquired from NZTA since, uh, since making the submission, which I'll refer to in just a minute. Uh, so, for those of you uh, who I haven't had a chance to, to meet personally, uh, and may not know me. Um, my name is Robert Thompson, I'm the chair of Spokes Dunedin. So Spokes is a uh, Dunedin cycling advocacy organization. And um, we our, our aim is to speak out for everyone who rides a bike or who would like to ride a bike in Dunedin. I'd like to start off by just thanking the council for everything it's been doing for cycling over the last year. I think we've been seeing quite a lot of good progress over the last year. And I'd also like to congratulate, congratulate the council uh, for taking these initiatives. Um, I think they contribute to making Dunedin a more livable city, a more human city. And it's initiatives like this that will make Dunedin one of the world's best small cities. Uh, now Dunedin is a great place to live and the Otago Peninsula is really one of the, one of the crown jewels uh, for Dunedin. And while this, this project is a, a safety project primarily, it, it also does provide an additional amenity, um, not only a safety improvement, but uh, walking, well, it's, I guess it's a sort of an amenity if you consider safety an amenity, um, but it will improve safety and access for pedestrians and cyclists. So just like the Esplanade, John Wilson Drive, uh, it's not only uh, something for the people who live just on the peninsula, but uh, this forthcoming infrastructure is something for everyone in the city. Um, now we think that the progression from the city end makes the most sense, uh, but I'll discuss in a little bit while I think there is some compromise to be made um, as we put in our submission. And I, and I hope you do, it is, we put in kind of a long submission, and I know you have heaps of submissions to read, but I hope you do get a chance to look through it. Um, Vauxhall to Glen Falls, uh, from a cyclist perspective, is really the most dangerous section. Uh, there's more traffic there, obviously, because it's closer to the city. There's also more cyclists there because it's closer to the city. You've got a lot of recreational cyclists who come from the city out to the peninsula and back. A lot of people ride out just as far as McAndrew Bay at lunchtime because it's a nice, about an hour out to McAndrew Bay and back from the city center. So it's a nice lunchtime ride. And the lack of consistency and connectivity uh, that you get from the, the current uh, layout where the city end is sort of deprioritized uh, really creates a barrier to uh, usability 
for the largest number of people who would use it. So if I can talk a minute about the safety issues from the cycle's perspective and refer you to the, the handout, which I just handed out all of them and forgot to keep one for myself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is some, some information that I've obtained from NZTA recently. And on the, the graph on the left shows uh, the number of crashes between 2008 and 2012, which involve a cyclist. Uh, so the left-hand part of this graph is urban crashes, and the right-hand part is rural, rural crashes. And here, urban roads refer to those with speeds of less than 70 kilometers per hour. So for all intents and purposes, Portobello Road, especially between uh, Glen, uh, Vauxhall and Glen Follett, is, is a, for all intents and purposes, a rural road. Is that 70 or less, or less than 70? Uh, well, that's a good question, what, where the 70 mark lies, but uh, roughly 70 and less, I suppose. So, yeah, so, so I'm just saying that quite a few places are 70, and so they come into the mesh there, so it's 70 or less. Or less. On Portobello Road? Yeah. yeah uh, well, that's a good question. I would, I, I would posit that between Vauxhall and Glen Follett, you have a lot of traffic that's moving faster than 70 kilometers per hour, from my personal experience, uh, being out there quite often. Um, so just to look at just a, just a quick look at this this graph. What, the point is that while most uh, crashes involving cyclists occur in urban centers, uh, the severity of crashes uh, increases on rural roads. And the, the the primary factors there are speed and lack of uh, clearance when overtaking. And what it shows here is that. Uh, you're more likely to, to, be, to be involved in a crash in an urban setting, but if you're involved in, an urban, in a crash in a rural, rural setting, you're much more likely to die or be seriously injured. Uh, so over 80% of the fatal crashes on rural roads are not at intersections, and about 70% of serious injuries on rural roads are not at intersections. And it turns out that most of the serious injuries and fatalities on rural roads are actually on relatively straight roads uh, where the speeds are higher. And this is particularly relevant to that section between Glen Pollock and Vauxhall, where the road is reasonably straight. It's straight enough to allow you to go quite fast, but it's also deceptive in that the visibility is actually not that good. So the high speeds coupled with the poor visibility leads to risky overtaking maneuvers. And, um, so this, this creates a, a sort of a ripe opportunity for, for quite a serious accident involving a cyclist. And there are a lot of existing users out there who are cycling out there on a daily basis. Um, and now in our submission, I don't know if you have that in front of you, but we also have a graph, uh, again from NZTA, of the, um, the importance of speed, uh, relative speed, on the probability of death in a crash. And you can see that the, the probability of death rises quite dramatically uh, for, for impact speeds higher than about 30 kilometers per hour. And it turns out that on rural roads, uh, not only are most of these fatal and serious injuries, well, fatal in particular, fatal injuries, or fatal injuries, fatalities, uh, not only do they occur on straight roads, but they occur from behind. People are hit from behind, so it's not a, it's not a head-on situation. Uh, so even for a cyclist traveling between 20 and 30 kilometers per hour, uh, being hit from behind by a car traveling between 70 and 80 kilometers per hour, you're still in that sort of 50 to 60 uh, kilometer per hour impact speed on this graph. And, and the, the probability of death in that case is quite high. So in particular, the stretch between um, uh, Vauxhall to Glen Follett, as I said, you have a, a higher uh, amount of traffic, more cyclists, greater speed, also a lack of width, and risky overtaking maneuvers. So this is a very high risk section, and to be honest, um, it's, it's quite ripe environment for a, a fatality, and, and it's a little bit surprising that we haven't had a more serious injury. Um, back in 2012, uh, we called attention to the, the Doring risk, uh, particularly on, on Cumberland Street, and, and in particular we, we pointed out the hospital block as being a a particularly um, prone location for that type of, of incident to occur. And unfortunately, it wasn't too much longer before that actually happened and someone died. Um, and, and aside from the one ways, uh, based on the number of cyclists and the, and the number of road users on Portobello Road, 
I'd say that uh, that that section in particular on Portobello Road is is ripe for a, a serious accident. Um, I would say that from a cycling perspective, the the other sections are of a lower priority. In particular, the the sections where it's past um, past Glen Follick, in particular, the road becomes much more windy, and these these curves, these these wind, this winding road naturally moderates the speed of vehicles. Uh, there's also less traffic further out, and there are fewer cyclists as well. So, although we think that the um, progression from the city end makes the most sense, uh, we also recognize the interests of the, of the peninsula communities and the benefits that they'll gain uh, from having this. But I would also say that there is existing off-road connectivity within both Broad Bay and Portobello communities, although uh, I freely admit that there's poor interconnectivity between those two communities. And the, the section of road between Broad Bay and, and Portobello is is not is not great. It's, it's quite uh, quite risky as well. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about the, the schools, access to schools in Broad Bay and Portobello, but if you look at the details of the of the proposed work, um, these schools are not directly serviced by by the road widening. Um, I would also just point out that that the Portobello community actually rejected the boardwalk between the boat club and the cannon, so there's actually no widening that's going to be done in that on that section of the road. Um, so from a cyclist perspective, it, it seems like these sections are more of an amenity than a, than, than a direct uh, safety improvement. Um, so so we, we do recognize that these are important for those communities, and it'll certainly improve those communities. Um, so we think that there is a compromise to be had, but that the, the Portobello to, or sorry, the, uh, the Vauxhall to um, Glen Follock section is certainly the highest priority in terms of, in terms of cyclist safety anyway. Obviously, the best option would be to bring forward the completion date, as has been discussed. And I know that uh, this may not be possible, but it's certainly something that uh, everyone should be doing their best to, to, um, to try to achieve. And I think there's some solid economic reasons for, for doing so. Um, we've heard about changes and potential changes in NZTA co-funding, uh, which means that we could save a significant amount of money in the long run by completing it sooner. Um, I think there's also an opportunity cost in the tourism sector by not completing it sooner. Um, some of our counselors here know better than I the, the economic impacts of the Central Otago Rail Trail and how that's been a lifeline for the communities out there. And I think that um, uh, tourism in Dunedin could see similar gains. So, so in the long run, it could in fact pay for itself. Uh, there's also other economic factors that I won't get into but are, are in our submission. And I encourage you to take a look at that. Now, there's another thing that I would like to uh, bring up real quick that's actually not in the submission. And that's, uh, and maybe this is, is, it's kind of a council staff issue and it's maybe better directed at uh, Dr. Vidros and, and Mr. Avery over here. Um, and that's a question of upskilling some of our uh, PCC staff. So there are precious few cycling dollars that are being given out. Um, and we want to get the best outcomes for these, for the investments of sort of um, what we're getting. So we want to make sure that we get infrastructure that works and that cyclists will use. And what I'm finding is that a lot of time we, we get these out-of-town consultants who don't really know anything about Dunedin and, and, and don't actually know that much about cycling. Um, I've gotten several examples where, where we've been given the plans from the DCC that have been drawn up by some, some outside out-of-town consultants and really they're terrible. Um, these people, whoever is doing it, obviously doesn't really know the basics about uh, cycling infrastructure. Um, so I think, I think we're, we're losing a lot of money, um, we're wasting a lot of money on some of these, some of these consultants when I think that uh, our in-house people could be doing a similar job or, or should know, um, should be able to look at these things and, and, and pick out the basic design flaws. Um, and there's, there's also a lot of cycling stuff coming up, both in the, in the central city and for the Portobello Road. So I think it, it uh, makes sense to upskill some of the in-house in transport staff so that they can are better prepared to, to deal with this some, of the, some of the stuff we get from some of these consultants. Thank you, Robert. Questions, Councillor Wilson. Uh, look, I just, um, just for clarity, and because I think we have to be fair to the previous submitter included, um, you obviously live in 
um, Irvine Road North Cove and have some benefit. Has your submission been through all of the spokes members and where do they live? Uh, so this submission was done uh, with the spokes committee mm -hmm. and sent around. We had, so we have, we have sort of multiple levels in spokes. So we have a committee of six people, a uh, standing committee of six people, and then we have a larger sort of reference group of about 15. And then we have our larger membership, which is, which is about 600. Um, and so the submission was drawn up by the, the committee and some of the particularly interested people from the reference group, and then it was passed around the rest of the reference group as well. Okay. Um, and I don't think you can speak for spokes on this, but I'm going to ask you as an individual. Um, you, you, you suggest speeding it up, which has been suggested by some other uh, submitters as well. Um, would you consider it fair if there was a targeted rate for the area that is most likely to benefit most greatly for it? to speed that up, or would you personally think that that is something that should be spread citywide? Um, oh, that's a good question, and again, as, as I said at the beginning, I think this is something that's, uh, that benefits everyone in the city, and there are a lot of users who come from the city that, uh, that use it. Obviously, I do, I do live on the peninsula, so I personally would be, would be willing, but uh, um, you know, I, I have a clear interest in, in using facilities myself. So it's, it's hard to tell someone in the Strathtyre who are paying substantial rates on a farm that they are going to benefit from it. Well, that's that's <laughs> true, but then again, I pay I pay rates that uh, that pay for things out in the strike Park. So. <laughs> it's not much, actually. Not, uh, <laughs> we don't even have a one that we Right. Well, but but it's it's a question of whether you want to have a sort yeah. of pay to play society. You know. I mean. Are there any questions, Councillor Tom? Well, look, I'm, I'm not sure whether mine's a question. Well, it's not. I know it's not a question of, of, of uh, Spokes or, or Robert, um, but uh, I just wonder whether I, I had foreshadowed a question relating to this to start around with around what the rules might be in terms of bringing um, something forward in terms of the transit contribution, uh, given that. There, there's clearly an additional cost to council in doing that, but it's possible that that additional cost would be offset by longer term savings because of the possibility, as you've alluded to, um, there would be a, uh, there is likely to be a reduction in the, going forward in the contribution from transit, so our portion of it might be higher, our portion of the cost might be higher if we do it later. <coughs> can I, can can I, say, you've had can I suggest that that is a, valid question to inform the deliberations, but we don't need to know the answer now unless it's the answer is going to clarify another question to the submitter. No, well that, that's, that's fair enough, but I, I suppose it's just signaling because the deliberations are actually only a few days away. So No, no, I appreciate that, but we've got very limited time now, oh, okay. and that question is going to inform the deliberations and we can get the input from the start of that. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you um, for your submission, Robert. The, the question that I have is around the South Dunedin work that's mm -hmm. currently underway, and I appreciate the points that you guys have made. Just thinking in terms of outcomes from here, I guess Council has a couple of different options available to it. One is to pause the work where it currently is, revisit plans, and do that in conjunction with the community, I suppose. Are you, are you, talking, are you talking about a specific? The, yeah, specifically the, the rollout of that um, three-staged package of routes, which is currently underway in South, in South Dunedin. Mm -hmm. um, Another option is to let that rollout finish, monitor that as a particular set of interventions and, and look at how well that works or not. Um, or maybe there's another option which I haven't thought of. Do, do, you, do you guys have a specific suggestion around a way forward that you would like to see with reference to those South Dunedin routes given where they're at now? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't think we should, we should pause and I think that would have ramifications for for future funding, and probably council staff could tell you better about. It. I don't really know about that kind of stuff very well. Um, I think it's I think it's a good idea to just to be <coughs> careful about what we're putting on the ground to make sure that it's the best outcome for the investment. Um, and obviously, a lot of it's already in progress or complete. Um, you know, things like the uh, Portsmouth Drive shared path widening. Is already complete. That's great. Um, Shore Street is is nearing completion. 
other bits are nearing completion. So some of those packages are already already finished or in train. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure which parts of it you're talking about pausing. But, but yeah, certainly, the, the, I think the process, and at least in, in going forward, um, should maybe be a little bit more considered about just what goes on the ground to make sure we get the best outcome. Further questions? Thank you, Robert. Submissions appreciate Ms. Evans. Should be Lonnie Evans, I'm evidently not Lonnie Evans. I was still looking wide awake enough for you. Sorry? I was still looking wide enough for you. A few of you are looking rather referring uh, towards uh, sleep. Right. Which one? Um, Star of Unification Trust is who which one? Correct. You're speaking for. Correct. Right. And you're standing in for Lani. I am. Uh, Lani has just texted me in as the CEO of a um, very successful upstart company, a, a cloud-based company in Dunedin. Startup. Startup company, <laughs> uh, which is doing very well. She can't spare the time, so she's, in her words, asked me to wing it. So I shall uh, <laughs> endeavour to do so. Uh, have you got a copy of the submission you've made? I, I have also picked that up, so yes, there's, there's a few marks on it. Let me put these on. Okay, the um, first page of submission is obviously very evident, introducing ourselves, and as you know, we came along to, the, uh, to a public forum about three weeks ago, just to introduce ourselves uh, as a group, and broadly, the trust has been formed in essence to replace what was previously the State Highway 88 Beautification Trust, which did some sterling and phenomenal work on Dunedin's West Harbour, and people can see evidence of that today. Um, number one uh, point in the submission, of course, Sycamore Control, and I alluded that, to that earlier separately uh, via the Chalmers Community Board. And Further down, I, I read that the West Harbour Beautification Trust would like to see an increased effort from Council to address this problem locally, uh, and the Trust is eager, eager to work in partnership. Um, of course, as I reported, and I can um, uh, refer to that again, that that has taken place. Two days ago, I had a meeting with uh, Mick Reese and Lisa Wheeler, and the West Harbour Beautification Trust was very kindly invited along to that. And uh, come Jan uh, July 1st, there should be a report out uh, in which the trust will be involved, so uh, pat on the back to, to Parks and Recs of that. Um, and actually the first, uh, the, the first, I think the first project will be looking at those not more than 20 to 30 young trees, which um, uh, Councillor Vandervis, I know earlier you alluded to using wood, but these are literally the fire, fire starters rather than uh, keeping you snug and warm. Uh, number two, the adopter box scheme. It's just very evident what that does. Uh, been very successful. It was a, sort of a pilot scheme for the trust, just to see if we could work in partnerships with the, um, the shop owners. Um, we had lots of inquiries, and next year, um, I think we'll have another list that goes well beyond the number of boxes available. And particularly beautiful at cruise ship season, because a lot of boxes are just next to where the cruise ship passengers enter the high street, and. Um, Many hundreds of them can be seen clicking pictures of whatever they are, begonias and carnations and whatever wonderful plants are in them at any given time. Number three, cycle walkway maintenance. That'll be a major part of what the Trust tries to achieve um, in partnership with Rotary, who are going to be doing some great work at the beginning of the cycleway. Um, and you can read in, in that the Trust is in the process of fundraising to beautify a sitting area near the St. Leonard's end of the current path. We have fundraised already for that. We do have the money in place. And thankfully, we're working in uh, <coughs> alongside David Blair, who many of you will be aware of, who, who is um, um, one of the best people to have on board when you're doing native plantings. And the reason I think we've probably written the bit at the end is just to make council um, aware of the fact that there'll be no, hopefully, no or very little maintenance costs beyond minor weed control, which you, is, you are contracted to do anyway. Uh, number four is just straightforward, obviously supporting the, the wonderful biodiversity fund, which uh, obviously gives out money and um, produces great outcomes for the city. Number five, obviously supporting food resilience. Um, food resilience, uh, the 22,000 funding, I think it's a great idea. And, and one of our modus operandi will be to encourage and educate people in food resilience in the West Harbour area. 
On to number six. I don't know how many funding requests you get that are actually a pun, but uh, seed funding um, for the trust. And I don't even know if I'm allowed to read this bit out that Lani's written because it's, um, it's sort of a bribe. I'll read it anyway. Tell council that if they fund us, there is a bowl of fruit in it for them at the annual plan submission of 2016. So there you go. And 2016. 2016. Well, they've, got, they've got to grow. They've got to bed in and grow. And um, I think uh, I think the trust trust members and community should be first to chomp on the wonderful uh, projects. Um, we've applied to uh, for funding. Um, in fact, what we did actually in the latest Ross Sea News, the wonderful West Harbour. Um, community paper, we just put out a, a little note asking uh, interested uh, parties in the West Arbor who would like to have a fruit tree placed on our new year land, uh, get in touch with us. We've had a phenomenal response to that, so we asked COGS for funding for 30 trees, but we've had far more um, interest than 30. So we're politely asking council if they'd be interested in providing us with five heritage apple trees and five heritage pear trees. Total cost three hundred and ten dollars, so um, not a not a great uh, demand. So, yep, willing to take any questions? Councillor Walsh. Um, at that expense, I'm just surprised it's not going to your local community board. Well, I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure the the, we'll, the trust will be trotting along there on many occasions in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Lani. Okay. Your submission. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, uh, Kilda North, North Park. Oh, if you want to submit it to page 608 in volume 2. Page 608, volume 2. Petra not coming. Uh, not speaking. Welcome. Hello. I'll stand. Um, my name's Kilda Northcott. Kia ora, hello. And I come from a performing arts background. I've been living in Dunedin in a while now, but I just wanted to provide a bit of colour. It's a colourful bit of cloth. And it's a little bit contradictory because I'm actually talking about native trees, but these are not natives. But I couldn't find anything of native cloth from at home. So anyway, that's my token <coughs> colour. And this is my wonderful companion, my friend. Stephen, you might um, recognise Stephen, he's sort of, there's different varieties of him around the place. Uh, he and I are getting on really well at the moment, but he's from <laughs> Stephen's Island. He's a Phytosporum, and for some of you that don't know much about Phytosporums, um, they, this one in particular grows, uh, I'm quite nervous, my heart was thumping over there, so I can't believe it. <laughs> it grows to nine metres plus two metres, and uh, it has all these features as it grows up and you can trim it down and do all that sort of thing. And it has wonderful white perfumed flowers on it. So anyway, before I launch into what I came here to talk, my main point to talk about, I just wanted to say that one of my points in my submission was getting something for rate, my, the rates I pay. And one of the ideas I had was that it would be really cool if council provided a... Um, a a, a discount on things like traps for stoats, possums, weasels, rats, mice, things like that. I know you can get them from various places, but I, I for one would be someone who if I could, I'd put a fence around my, my property and put lots of uh, traps out. But I don't know whether the council does that already or not. But Anyway, and I thought I'd just write a few things down. Um, so one of my big bugbears, and it sort of follows on from what Steve was saying, one of my big bugbears is the continued and willy-nilly planting of non-native trees and the lack of native trees not being planted in and around the city and the rash of pest trees suffocating the city landscapes. I know and understand the Otago Regional Council is not acknowledging that there is a plague pest trees out there to be ignored at great peril, I say. In Dunedin, I feel, there's not really any one street or suburb in the inner city, so to speak, that I feel gives me the sense that I am an Aotearoa. Except perhaps good old South Dunedin, King Edward Street, 
I applaud beautification and landscaping that has recently been completed there. This is at least a beginning. And I also want to acknowledge the, exis the extensive work being done by groups like Trees for Babies and other restoration projects going on around Dunedin, one of which Steve was talking about I've joined up with recently. And I don't know what happened to Project Crimson. It was a big Meridian energy project. But what happened to Project Crimson? Is the council in on that or not? Anyway, why on earth in this day and age does the City Council, the Otago Regional Council and Transit New Zealand continue to plant non-native species? There are areas, roads and streets that I am deeply saddened by as I drive through them or move through them. They are to name but a few. Highway 88, George Street in the city and Port Chalmers and the Port Chalmers area. The approach to the airport, tourists coming in, tourists going out. The sweeping avenue road that leads to the airport, sadly, no natives. In front of and behind the railway station, Again, no natives. Queen's Garden. I was passing by there recently and I noticed two trees outside the building that houses the Duke of Wellington pub. Again, two trees just recently planted. Little ones, non natives. Hillside Road, sad. The one way system south. The planting at the front of the stadium. I went and had a really good look the other day. All the large trees, fantastic planting behind the stadium. All the trees in front of the stadium, non-natives. The big trees planted along, underneath and beside the extended highway and motorway out to Mosgill, past Cavisham, to the airport, non-natives. The little park on Ned Street, I work around there, in Kaipara, non-natives. Just recently, two or three years ago, an additional two trees were planted. Again, they matched the other trees, non-natives. The list goes on and on and on. A travesty, I say. With native and appropriate planting, we have colour, birds, potential, uniqueness, an authentic point of difference, honouring the past, the present, the future. Believe it or not, this is 2014. Hello, the needed could lead the way. Look into the future, Otako, Aotearoa, a refuge for birds, the people, creating warmth and beauty, the Neden, a city of wonder, a city revered for its bravery, a destination, a haven. I have lived in the Neden for eight years now, and this is what I see, day in and day out, summer, winter, autumn, spring. Bleak, cold, grey, empty, deserted, forlorn, colourless, ugly, sad, forgotten, bereft, abandoned, desolate, barren, orphaned, disjointed, scraggly landscape. Must be tempting to go home, is it? <laughs> what was that? Must be tempting to go home, is it? No, no, it's not tempting because I moved here for a reason. I like Dunedin. It's quaint, it's cute, and it's quiet. I'll tell you a little story, just real quick. You will need to be because you've okay. got five minutes, is that? Okay, well, everybody else has had <laughs> way longer, so I'm So they haven't. <laughs> You're five minutes. I am begging please come to a conclusion. The Otago Regional Council, Transit New Zealand and the powers that be, please, 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 in the future to plant natives and or edibles. Don't get me wrong, I love non-natives too, if they have a relevant and practical place in the landscape. Thank you. Questions? Uh, any questions? Questions, councillors? Rana, thank you for your submission. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, Ms. Morris, Lee Morris, Holly. Sorry, <coughs> Now, you, you're speaking for yourself. I just got a note here on I'm speaking for myself, but I'll also speak on behalf of Petra Wink. If yep, that's fine. If that's okay. Yep. It'll be quite oh, yes, that's right. We've missed one. But thank you. Yep. yep. Well, I can be Petra Wink. 
first or after? Yep. yep. Do that. Do that. Yeah. So, councillors, this is for. I want to go back to the chair. I'm staying there. Councillors, the, the uh, submission by Petra Wink had been crossed out on my list, but uh, Lee is speaking for her first and then for yourself, so far away. Thank, thank you for giving me that time, or giving Petra that time. Um, and you probably read, have you read the, the submission? Cool. Okay, I'm well, going to read that again. Um, except to say, in her words, as she was said tonight, um, I believe that the first priority of the Harbour Cycleway is to make it continuous from Company Bay to round the harbour towards my harbour. The section missing in the middle creates a dangerous bottleneck. As she says to me, I travel regularly both down the Portobello Road to Queen's Bay and towards the city from the cove. A continuous connection from the city to Macandrew Bay will not only be a benefit to those that cycle and walk, but it will be a valuable asset to tourism and recreation, also small businesses at both ends. I support the joining up of the cycleways that are there at present. Thank you, Petra Wink. That's a brief summary of what she <coughs> sees as a priority. Okay, do you feel able to answer any questions on her behalf or do you want to go on? Yes, I think so. Yes, yes. So, any questions? So, Councillor Wilson? Just for clarity, is she a cyclist or and walker on that area or is it one of just concern potentially as a driver on that road? She drives mainly but has had a stint of cycling and we had an accident one evening which put her off a wee bit. Um, we do, on quite a, regularly, hop in the car, go to Glencullock and walk the of the cycleway, walk away from there. Mm. It's great. We would like to be able to do that from our own home, but what the heck. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from that submission? Okay. Far away, Lee. On right. On yours. Well, thank you for giving me the time. My name's Lee Morris. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I support the linking up of the existing cycle walkway in the interest of safety both cars and cyclists. At present, many cars back up behind one cyclist. They can't pass until the next clear stretch of road. Not always a good choice. You're all very conversant with that bit of road, and as I was mentioned before, it's, it's got a few false corners on it. It's got false, you think it's good, but it's not. It can turn bad quite quickly. Cyclists feel pressured to keep left, uh, they speed up, cars feel obliged to try and pass at unsafe places. This is a very regular occurrence. Close calls. If I'm at home, I'm, I'm home quite regularly in the cove and I've got a good um, visual outlook of the curve by the boat shed cove there. And I tell you, it's really entertaining in a sick kind of way. Uh, I've seen cars overtake cyclists on a blind corner. I've actually witnessed one car giving way, stopping to let the over -car, overtaking car fit in again, coming the other way. Nightmare stuff. Um, as far as entertainment value, it's probably equal to watching cars on the Amalfi Highway in the west coast of Italy at night in the evenings. I've sat there and watched the horrendous things that people do, and it reminds me of that road outside home. <coughs> I challenge any councillor to come to my place for a cup of tea at weekend. It doesn't matter what time of the day, if the cyclists and cars on that stretch of road, <coughs> you'll watch an accident or a close accident happen. Adding onto the cycleway at the far end of Portobello Road still does not give certainty of a safe cycleway to the city. If this section between Vauxhall and Glen Valley is not completed as soon as possible, we will have created two cycleways. Number one, city towards Port Chalmers, and number two, between Glen Valley and Pass Company Bay. I don't see the sense in it. I want this panel to make the right decision and complete a wonderful and safe public asset that unites the harbour on both ends to our beautiful city. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Questions? Councillor McTouch. Blue your house is it's just down on the road, is it? Is that why you can yeah, okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, right. I can hear them. Uh, okay. You, you, you my other neighbours as well, I said you you just have to sit ten minutes and out of the deck and you watch it, a close one happen. Because people 
they're held up by cars, they want to get past, they think it's clear, and it's not. It's just, it's a, it's a great piece of road. That's why people cycle. And as Petra said earlier, <laughs> sorry, sound didn't come out right. Uh, there's more and more people using it now weekends. And as the other guy said before, people are using it in their lunch hours too, eccentric cyclists. So it's getting more use than it used to, it's getting more, more bikes. So one more bike equals one less car. No further questions. Thank you, Lee. Thank you much. Appreciate your submission. Um, Sarah Lister. Welcome, Sarah. Um, I believe that the current entry prices to Mwanapal are far too expensive for tertiary students. The current system of pricing means that only tertiary students who hold a community services card are able to get a discount on the adult price of $6 per swim. And this means that student, students like me who don't hold a community services card have to pay, pay the full $6. Um, just because I don't hold a community services card doesn't mean that I have a large disposable income. In 2012, there were just over 400,000 tertiary students in New Zealand. However, only approximately a quarter of these students held a community services card. Um, I think that $6 is far too much money to be paying to go to the pool. Over the past month or so, I've spoken to several students about the current system of pricing, and they've all told me that they're shocked and outraged at the high price. Students generally earn minimum wage, therefore after tax, $6 equates to just over half an hour's pay for a student. The fact that students pay the same amount as working adults doesn't proportionately reflect their incomes. A student who earns minimum wage and only works part-time has to pay the same amount as an adult who earns a significantly higher income. Mm -hmm. Um, the current system of pricing is not proportionate to the income of tertiary students and therefore hinders the ability of students to improve their fitness. Um, the pool currently does have a student deal where students can pay $190 and have unlimited access to the pool for nine months. However, this deal doesn't take into account that many students live in Dunedin year-round and that you would have to go to the pool more than once a week in order to make a saving on this deal. Furthermore, it does not take into account students who don't look into the deal until later in the year. Therefore, I propose that the Council could undertake two options to make the pool more affordable for students. The first is to include students in the concession price of $3.60. Um, this would make sense as a concession should be made for people who don't earn very much as they are undertaking education. The Council currently makes a concession for other low earning groups of people such as children, the elderly and those who hold community services cards, i.e. those who are on government benefits. Therefore it is logical that this be extended to another group of low earning people, students. The second option is to create an alternative student package to the one already in place. This option takes into account the fact that the pool is already overcrowded as it is without throwing a large number of students into the mix. Therefore, I propose a system whereby students who wish to go to the pool regularly are able to get some kind of package where they pay, for example, $36 for 10 entries to the pool. And the entries would not be limited to a certain period as the current system is. This system is unlikely to lose the council any money due to the principle of supply and demand. For example, at $6 per entry, I might only go to the um, six months, but if I pay 36, I can go 10 times then I will save money and the council won't lose any money. The council could even end up gaining money from this scheme. Introducing a new system of pool pricing that works better in favour of students would benefit both students and the council as it would ensure that students have better access to fitness facilities in Dunedin. Therefore I propose that the council changes the pool pricing scheme for tertiary students. Thanks, Thank you, Sarah. Councillor McTavish. Thank you. It's a great submission. Um, Two questions. Firstly, I'm trying to get my head around the community services card. It's changed since I was at uni. Um, and the criteria seem very vague. Um, is it the case that if you're getting an allowance, you basically qualify, but if you're not getting allowance, you basically don't? So that's, that's how I understand it. Yeah, okay. Um, second question. 
At the moment, we have a bit of capacity issue at Moana Pool. Mm -hmm. um, the, at, at certain times, at peak times, and it's possible that if we had an avalanche of students because we created this, it may cause more problems. <coughs> would you, how, how receptive do you think the student body would be to a situation where we might be able to create some sort of concession card but limit it to off peak times? Would it Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Councillor Kelp. I think probably you're quite right in your suggestion or your guess that a lot of students would qualify for a community services card. Um, I'm struggling a wee bit with the idea that if a student can't be bothered to go through the process of applying for one, students who have more time and less money on the whole, um, that other ratepayers should work an extra hour of their time to pay more rate so as that student who can't be asked doesn't go and get a community services card. If you, I mean, I'm I'm just thinking that a lot of students would. So I'm just wondering whether part of the answer to that would be to encourage the Students Association, get together with them to see if there's any way of streamlining or make it easier for people to get community services cards so that they can do that more because there's other benefits all over the place for having that community services card. One of the things from our point of view is a cosy homes and other things, you know, so, some of those sorts of things kick in when you have a community services card. So the more students who have them, if they're eligible, probably the better we all are. Yeah, um, so. it's probably only a small number of people who are in that position, because I, I know a lot of people who, because um, they're not on allowance, they can't get a card, so I'm sure there are a lot of people who sort of can't be bothered, and that's why I didn't include them in my speech night, because I decided that probably wasn't the best way to go about arguing my case, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, I think that there's, there are a lot of people out there like me that because I, um, I because of my parents' income I can't get a card and for that reason I can't get a cheaper price to the pool, so yeah. <laughs> Um, you've probably done some homework on the concessions that are already available as, as in um, the memberships that you can get. Um, and oddly, I mean, even for a six month one, um, it's, you only have to go more than once every six days and you're saving on what your current position is. And taking the Les Mills and any gym fitness that um, policy is that you encourage people to make the most benefit by giving and encouraging them to keep on swimming by the more they use it. The, the cheaper the, the swim. You don't think there's some benefit in encouraging people to use things more to get that benefit? Um, not completely, but um, I don't know, like, students are quite busy, I guess. It's are they busier than anyone else? <laughs> well, <laughs> 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 yeah. I know, it does, I mean, any, any other fitness centre that you join that generally is encouraged to get make the most value out of it by having a quantum and the more you use it the cheaper that swim or that gym experience is. But it's not yeah, I, The reason that I wouldn't go for the $190 thing is um, like because I only just discovered it at this yeah. point in the year and I personally probably would go around once a week but probably not enough. Do you realise that there's a 230 dollars six month membership fee as well that you can get at any time or a 400 Dollars for 12 months membership. It's affected in, in already. You weren't aware of those. Uh, no, I was aware of the 190 dollar one. That's a student one specifically, oh, which I don't think is actually covered off in our recent list. Can I suggest yeah. that we're getting into discussion yeah. here more than a little? Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's shocking that your parents aren't fully supporting you to the age of 25. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> are you? I don't think it's your parents. I'm no, it says on. It is. Trust me. Um, are you, you're at the university? Yeah. Have you raised this with the Students Association? Because I noticed it wasn't in their submission. No. Okay. Um, is it there? Are, and I can't remember if it was you that raised this or if someone else has raised this. To qualify, you have to prove that you're a full time student and get a letter of confirmation from the. I understand there's some kind of process involved. To qualify beyond having a community services card, is that right? I think <coughs> what I understand of it is that you have to be on a government benefit, so okay. student allowance. 
Um, sorry. Um, and just lastly, at once upon a time, there was, through the swimming pool, uh, two for one admission through Moana Pool for students, which doesn't necessarily help you as an individual, but do you, would you be supportive of, I mean, would that go some way yeah, to fix it? Yeah, that would probably work Okay, thanks. Thanks for coming. Council so um, Thank you, good submission. Um, question more for staff than anything else is um, if we can find out how many students actually take up a um, membership and uh, to go to the swimming pool, and if there's ability to work out how frequently they do go. Well, I think um, what I was going to suggest is that we actually get together some information, some that Councillor Wilson was referring to, some that uh, Councillor Holmes is referring to and what you've asked about, and feed it back to some of the submitters, because Councillor Holmes is right, there is another submission, and I think it is from the Students Association, which refers to uh, only full-time students being able to get any concession at all, and they're seeking it for all students. So we, we won't be able to get to the bottom of that now, but I think we can collate that, we'll ask our, or ourselves to collate that information and feed it back to all the submitters. I think that would be sort of the way of dealing with it. There's no more questions. Sarah, thank you for your submission. It's a good one. Thank you. Um, Mr. Allen. Paul Allen. South Lead and Voice. And uh, Nick Wall Bellas uh, joining me, sir. Welcome. Um, good, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, and, and councillors. Uh, look, I'm, I'm not going to be too long. Basically, you've got the, you've got our submission in front of you, talking about a, a, a big uh, vote of thanks again to the council for supporting the uh, uh, South Dunedin Street Festival last year, and it was uh, a bigger success than, than the inaugural one. And we do say thank you uh, uh, to the city council for supporting that through the uh, through the community's funding. And, uh, and also for the physical presence for those people who did attend on the day. So thank you very much for that. And also for the uh, Community Expo, which uh, was held at um, St. Patrick's uh, Community Centre in South Dunedin as well. We will be running both of those, or intending to run both of those events this year. Again, the Community Expo in August and the Street Festival on the 8th of November. So, um, and we do have applications in for community funding for uh, for the street festival. Um, with that in mind, with that in uh, in mind, and note, we do notice that the the website, the city council, is lacking some photos for South Dunedin, which are recent um, uh, in regards to festivals on the South Dunedin page. I've got loads if you want them. So, um, and Sell them. <laughs> yes, you must welcome to buy them from me if you'd like to. Um, but uh, no, no, seriously, but if there were, if there are photos that you would like to to update that, uh, please do contact me. Um, the, the the main part of the submission uh, that we want to again reinforce is around the South Dunedin community facility and library, and I think it's been it's been really positive to know that it is back on, uh, continues to be on the agenda, it's been raised again and it has been um, um, certainly been discussed for proceeding. We do, we do want to encourage the, the next steps to happen, so the interim, an, an interim facility be, to be set up as, a, as perhaps a, a sign of good faith to the, the community of South Dunedin that this is actually in process. Um, certainly making sure that it's that people do know that it is a interim facility not the actual final facility um, uh, as per our submission there are lots of benefits which we feel would be uh, for the local community uh, both from education community uh, community uh, development and um, supporting uh, supporting the young people and our elderly people in our community with a uh, place to meet um, the, so that's probably the main aspect of the submission we're wanting to, to highlight. There, are, there, were, there was another section, psychoactive substances, but that's been addressed by national government. So, um, so um, that's, 
Charter. One of the other, two of the other issues, one which we certainly have had lots of discussion about cycleways, we acknowledge the progress uh, of cycleways. What we'd ask is continue to um, look at not just um, um, development, but making sure that they're actually safe for cyclists as well. They're in places that cyclists actually do want to travel and paths that they do want to travel. Um, um, uh, personally, a concern which I've had with the Shore Street uh, development, the number of times I've seen rocks over the newly developed uh, path, even with the new fences up, uh, is a concern. Um, uh, um, yeah, it, it, I think there needs to be a whole lot more work done to stabilise that cliff face to make sure it's safe for cyclists and all walkers along that path. Um, so safety. Safety is the biggest concern of cycling through South Dunedin in the, in, the, in the parts that have been developed. And the other issue is the, around the rising water levels, the water table in South Dunedin. It is, a, it, it is an area of concern for prop, both for, uh, for residents, for property uh, values, for property owners, and for, uh, for the, all of the um, uh, aspects of health issues related to damp homes if the water table is rising and we wanted to find out sort of what what is being investigated uh, what <coughs> solutions are being looked at and um, um, what consultation is out there in the community and what observational stuff is ha actually happening out there in the community as well so that's thank you so questions councillor mctavish I've just got one for thank you for your submission. It's pertaining to cycleways. We, we've just had a submission from Spokes articulating concerns about um, the infrastructure is after needing as well. Um, the decision that was made by the DCC to invest in the type of infrastructure that's going in was twofold. It was um, on the back of budget constraints and also recognising the need for a network that connected the schools. And I guess the third thing was um, a, a view of the consultant who was doing the work that, and given that this was effectively the first stage of the cycle infrastructure rollout in Dunedin, and there would be an appetite to remove parking along main routes. Um, Spoke submission very clearly at the time was that the preference for cyclists was separated infrastructure on main routes. Um, what is your, in, in terms of your submission saying, <coughs> want it, we cyclists want to go, um, what appetite do you think there is in South Dunedin for that parking on main routes versus cycling trade-off, which is inherently a conflict in that limited space area? I, I think, I, um, again, I can't speak because we haven't really... Uh, Communicated too much with or investigated with cyclists within the area, but, but um, what we're sort of asking is that there be ongoing conversation with the community uh, about the development. So, if there is a new path that's being looked at, then appropriate, then making sure that the, the parties and uh, both uh, from a commercial point of view as well as from the, the, the cyclist point of, the safety point of view as well is, is being consulted, and there is some form of consensus around the development of them. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a sort of non-answer, but it's sort of saying, um, keep the conversation open. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just a matter of saying, well, this is the path for a cyclist to go. Uh, if that's going to be completely inconvenient, one for the cyclist, because it's travelling down the wrong road, then that's a big issue. Um, but if it's going to be affecting uh, retail in a major way, then that's also going to be a, a problem as well. So it, I, I recognise that it's never going to be a perfect solution, um, but it's a matter of coming to a good, uh, engaging with the community and saying, well, what is a workable solution? I think I can legitimately um, comment on behalf of the business association who were pleased with the design of the um, the cycle way that took it out of the main street area where there is an existing parking issue which the South Main Business Association has submitted on. Um, looking towards yeah, future solutions, um, it's pro we're probably reasonably close to peak parking under its current regime there, so any, any move to share that corridor with parking 
but probably need a lot of reluctance from the retail community. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. Um, just regarding the proposed uh, South Dunedin library slash community complex, and I was interested to note you say that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you want to make, you want it to be clear that it is an interim measure. Okay. Yeah. And I just wonder if it works, this interim measure, why we would then go through the whole process of shifting it again. I mean, I know that there is long-term $8 million in the long-term plan for a new build, which may or may not be an abstract concept in reality. Mm. Um, but if we can, if it does work, if the trial goes ahead and it does work, do you have any objection to it staying As where it, it is? Or? Mm. I, 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 I would imagine that an interim, uh, an interim facility would be of a, um, a, a smaller working model rather than a full finished complex. Whereas I think the, the, the thought of the, the, the community facility would have a lot more uh, perhaps uh, amenities for the community, not just as a library facility, but actually as a meeting place. So it could be, there's, two, there's, there's a few aspects of that. Mm -hmm. And I think by, by utilising perhaps um, uh, empty shop facilities uh, or empty spaces which are currently out there as an interim process while a permanent facility is being designed, built, consulted on is, uh, is a... Could, could the permanent facility not also be in one of those empty spaces? I mean... Oh look, if we can... If, we can, if, a, if a permanent facility could be set up from the onset um, and it, it is, it's um, big enough, viable enough, it's got all the facilities that perhaps the community is looking at, then why would you not just go to a permanent facility? But, it's, um, it, but in the meantime, you could look at how long is that going to take to develop or do the renovations to get it up to that stage, whereas a, perhaps an interim facility might not need the... Uh, um, it might not, rec might not be up to the same quality standard as what the final facility would be, but it's a step along the way. Right. I, I guess the question is, would you rather the money be spent on the contents of the complex or the build of the complex? It's a good question which needs to be looked into further. Cool. Thanks, Paul. No further questions? Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Tango Art Society, Jenny Longstaff. Hi everyone, thank you for being here, I appreciate the time and effort, um, wish I brought some chips and pizzas for you. <laughs> um, I'll be succinct. Obviously I'm here to represent the Art Society, you all have seen my submission. I don't have anything further to table to you, but I do have some further comments to, to add to it. The last paragraph in my submission is the one that I want to start with first, and that's the one in which I thank the Janine City Council for their current financial support. Um, we're established down at the Janine Railway Station. Our galleries down there, I feel, are quite focal to the, the creative community in Dunedin. And I hope you see that your current financial support is money well spent uh, it certainly keeps the profile of Dunedin Arts community up there um, and it shows that the DCC by its um, subsidising of our um, rates rent um, to be supportive of the arts and local practitioners. Also the fact that we're in the Dunedin Railway Station we're a, a, a major focus for the tourist industry and it's not just an arts experience that we provide we are the first point of call very often for tourist information and often first aid. <laughs> People fall off or <laughs> need help. Uh, but that's a bit minor. It's all about the arts we're here, not um, whether we've got first aid certificates. I'll give you just a bit of personal background here to show that I'm totally committed to my presence in Dunedin and my involvement in the arts community and why I'm putting myself through this process because it's not 
coming naturally to me to be a front person. I've been a Dunedin resident and ratepayer for 30 years, except two years away during 2008-2010. When I returned, I decided to commit myself to art, heritage and tourism, to sing the praises of Dunedin as a wonderful place to live or to visit. So I became active as a practising artist and Otago Art Society member. Last year, I was appointed president. I don't have a lot of experience in admin or bureaucracy or form filling, but I do have the passion to keep Dunedin's flag flying as a vibrant, creative community. Uh, this is a little optional extra, but I also gained employment at Olverston Historic Home, and since Jeremy Smith became manager there, I have worked at fostering closer ties between his place and my place, engaging the public in appreciating creativity and heritage. There was always a close relationship between the Theaman family at Olverston and the Otago Art Society. In fact, David Theaman was president 90 years ago, and now I am in that role. So I know Jeremy gave a little blah blah. He got, he got off the mark early and got you while you were fresh. Um, so I'm just supporting his submission as well because I see that the heritage and the arts connection is really closely linked and the fact that the Dunedin Art Society is in the railway station, I think that is really key to our visibility and viability. Uh, the three keys that I most enjoy on my key ring are to my home, my heart and my art. One, the key to my house in North East Valley. It's a good example of a resilient community that hopefully Dunedin as a whole can become. Two, the key to Olverston Historic Home, my uplifting place of employment and aesthetic pleasure. Two, no, that's three. Key to the Dunedin Railway Station, it's an iconic heritage building and place of my community volunteer effort at the Otago Art Society. Um, in my submission, I touch on the fact, well, it's actually quite a major fact, that not only do we support a huge membership in the arts community, we've got 600 members, and it's quite interesting that the split is pretty much 50-50 between arts practitioners and just people who are just engaged in, in enjoying the arts, who want to be non-artist members. But our visibility down at the railway station and the fact that other events occur down there, the fact that we are in those gallery rooms, looking after those gallery rooms, keeping everything nicely presented. It does mean that place people, um, other organisations such as ID Fashion Week, they rent our facilities. It does mean that uh, the Hart Foundation can have a fundraising auction there. Science festival exhibitions can be held there. The centenary of the Dunedin Photographic Society, they held an exhibition there. Art Centre, the embroiderers. All these different community groups with a, a creative outlet, they come to us to, to rent our space. Um, the community gallery offers something. It's, it doesn't have as good facilities as us, obviously. Um, the calendar is stuffed full. Um, it's really key, I'll just reiterate, um, how we do appreciate your support and we uh, hope that we'll be ongoing. Um, just recently, we had a door counter put in the gallery. At the moment, we've got the Hope and Sons Art Awards on, our premier biennial exhibition. Since four days ago, there have been 2,100 people come through the Art Society stores. Good promotion being in the newspaper, and it is our, our key exhibition. But cruise ship season, we are so much more busy than that, and we didn't have a door counter on. Um, we have three part-time staff employed, and their roles are just getting busier and busier. The rest of us are volunteers. If our wages have to go up because our staff get more and more gamefully busy, uh, yeah, our outgoings are quite huge. We've kept our membership quite low. Um, so we do urge you to keep supporting us. At the last mayoral forum I spoke, and Mayor Cull said that we could have one or the other. Oh, this no, sorry, backtrack. Um, Dunedin City Council used to sponsor the City of Dunedin Art Awards. It was a biennial Art Awards. It was a, another key um, focus to our exhibition program. Uh, that got scrapped last year, the funding for that. Um, if, if we are in any danger of having our other SLA, whatever, um, changed, adjusted, and I perfectly accept as a Dunedin rate parent citizen where we're open to all these um, possibilities. Can we have one or the other? That's what Mia Cull said to me. We can't have both, but we can have one or the other. If we get scrapped as being supported in the rent and the rates, please can we have the exhibition back? 
I'd just like to put in a little plug for that. Um, also, because we're in the Anzac Avenue premises, we're presently in talks with other arts-related businesses in Anzac Avenue. Um, the World War I commemoration things are going to be huge, so we'd hate to be kicked out and not, not be part of the Anzac Avenue thing. We're in talks with the Otago Museum. Uh, we used to have premises in that little North Eden post office building there on the corner. It's now the HD Skinner Annex. And sometimes, uh, definitely, for instance, next year, Anzac Day, we're we've got a public hire, so our art society members won't be able to exhibit in our own premises. So that little cultivating network with the Otago Museum, we might be able to have an exhibition back in the HD Skinner Wing. Um, it all gets down to the fact, is art a luxury or a necessity? I think, to need and we need to consider that the arts are a necessity. They add so much to the, the fabric of our society, our community as a whole. Um, and we really, really, really are looking forward to seeing this arts and culture strategy. I know um, it comes down to resources, uh, and that's what it comes down to the Arts Society as well, with our minimum of paid employment and the rest of it all being volunteer run. Um, yeah, so we're a society that's been going for 138 years. We've got reliability behind us, we've got passion in front of us, and it's not about same old, same old, it's about being relevant, visible, and supportively engaged in the Dumedian community. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, can I just clarify? You don't. You're not under any impression. We haven't been given any indication that your tenure at the railway station is at risk, have you, or have you? I know we're safe this year, but everything's at risk in Dunedin. <laughs> no, but you haven't had any. No, nothing formal, nothing, nothing at all. Hearsay out in the community. If something feels too good to be true, it usually is. <laughs> Can I assure you that there's been no hearsay here? Um, thank you for that. <coughs> um, questions, Councillor Cal. I know this is perhaps a tad mean, but do your members, if we didn't invest in fossil fuels and then had less money and then couldn't give you so much, would that be a fair trade-off? Well, everyone has to cut their cloth to suit suit what's happening, and if we're all dedicated members of the Dunedin community, obviously adjustments are needed. I, I personally support that viewpoint. Does the Art Society, was what I was asking you, support the idea of they'd be happy to have less money if we invested in something that gave us less income? I haven't put that to any council meeting, but maybe I should. Any further questions? But can I just follow that up? Councillor Benson. But we are clear that the comment in your submission is a com about fossil f about ethical investment is a comment about the policy, the view of the art society. It's not a personal. What well, you're talking about the fossil fuel? Yeah, that's totally my personal opinion because I have not put it to the council and had any feedback from them. Have any of those ethical investment questions been put to the art society? No. Okay. No further questions. Thank you, Jenny. Sorry, can I? Oh, it's not a question, but it's um, just in lieu of that comment. I think people should be aware of the comment from staff under corporate policy that your comments regarding the confusing nature of the online submission form will be noted and considered in the development of next year's form. And I think you've made a comment somewhere. I just can't find it now, but you ended up... Yeah, yeah. Well. yeah, yeah. I, I, I ended up putting two in because I hit some button and it went off before I'd actually written my submission. And I thought, was that it? You know, and then I had another go at it. So, so, yeah. And the other thing, other comment I'd just like to say before I leave is, how do you guys get your head around talking about bicycles and plants and this and that? <laughs> Would it be perhaps a suggestion to have an arts group and a bicycle group and, you know, so you can all talk about the same thing on the same evening? Anyway, that's just a comment. I admire you for your flexibility. <laughs> we can multitask. Well, yeah. I, I think you'll find that the order of submitters is to suit the convenience of the submitters because some people can't come yeah, during the day. I appreciate that. Come, some people and I've benefited from that myself, so thank you. Yeah, that's probably why. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Bridget Irving. The next five minutes are yours to monopolise or whatever you like. Thank you. It's a slightly smaller room than I used to. <laughs> and 
you just pull the mic right in front of you, that's right. Sure. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak, uh, speak this evening. Um, I must confess I was prompted uh, to put a submission in after a speech from Dr Bidrose at a Dunedin Young Professionals event. She commented that there was um, certainly a plateau in terms of about my demographic and participating in the council's process. So here I am doing my bit to smooth that out for you. I think on top of the submission that I've put in writing, I just have a couple of points that I want to emphasise, and I'll deal with those relatively quickly. For my own, I am pleased with the approach that the council have taken um, through this year's annual plan. And it's my view that the council needs to continue to consolidate uh, where money is going uh, within the society. I think the council needs to continue to focus on its core functions, um, and there is a real risk that uh, we, I suppose, exacerbate uh, the deep problem that we have um, by trying to uh, spread ourselves too thinly. At this stage, I don't think that the city is in a position to undertake too many more projects such as new pools and libraries, and that at this point we need to make do with what we have and perhaps focus on looking to uh, grow the city uh, more effectively in a way where the city can sustain uh, those kinds of amenities uh, more effectively. And that leads me to my next point. Um, and one that perhaps sits a little bit outside um, the submission process strictly. And that's about my view uh, of the council needing to become a facilitator of development and progress within the city and not a handbrake. To be an organisation that's easy to deal with, open to new ideas that the community, developers and businesses might come to you with. I think there's certainly been improvements in that um, in recent years, but I still think that there is quite a long way to go. Programs such as that to support the adaptive reuse of historic buildings are good, but only take us so far. Building owners will only be inclined to spend money if there are people available and businesses available to tenant them. And I think if we can provide those opportunities, then it won't be necessary to subsidise the develop, redevelopment of those buildings. So I urge you to focus your attention and bear those things in mind as you're making the decisions that you have to make in relation to the annual plan. So I think I'll perhaps leave it there. Is there any questions? Thank you. Questions. Councillor Stout. Just in terms of the city being an, an, an enabler rather than you know, something difficult to deal with. The comment you've made, do you have any specific areas that you believe we are not, because there's been a lot of work in the last 12, year, 12 months for sure in trying to change the way we handle uh, applications to us to enable things to happen. So do you have any specifics because they might be helpful to us to understand that we're not doing well? Um, I don't think I'd like to talk about specific projects, um, but I think, and it's perhaps in a, a culture change within staff, um, and from my perspective, for those of you who don't know, I'm a lawyer, I do predominantly resource management work, and so we do a lot of work with council staff um, in trying to um, come up with solutions, and, and that's what we will often do. We, we feel that we put a path through um, that doesn't compromise the city in terms of your own obligations. Um, but I suppose staff are in a position where, um, to a certain extent, their skin they have in the game is to, to their own reputation, and so um, the, the motivations are different, and I think um, there perhaps needs to be a, a bit more of a top-down kind of um, approach to try and um, facilitate staff feeling that they are in a position to actually be more decisive, to um, be more proactive and to, um, I suppose, allow a slightly more flexible approach to some of the things that people come to them with. So, so what you're advocating is getting staff more ability and more confidence to make uh, the right decisions where statutory where it doesn't cross the statutory boundary. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. Um, and you said you don't want to talk about specific examples, which is unfortunate. Um, if you have a specific one you'd like to ask about, I can No, no, no. It was, well, it was just re relating, following on from Councillor Staines, when you refer to um, council as a handbrake, um, that's a fairly assertive claim, and I just wonder if that is based on your personal experience you have encountered council as being a handbrake on your professional work? Um, well, perhaps not my professional work, but the work of my clients, perhaps more accurately. Um, I mean, we have one example at the moment where we are in the position of trying to negotiate agreement with um, the council in respect of um, a developer. Um, on Friday, we had agreement in principle and um, the, for reasons best known to um, the council staff, we're now still waiting um, for confirmation through council's lawyers that we can go ahead. And the matter's time critical. There are options available if the agreement in principle doesn't work out for that issue to be mopped up through an alternative mechanism. So if this doesn't work out, the council doesn't miss out. Um, and for the life of me, I, I can't see why we just can't get on with it. Um, and each day that the decision is put off um, comes at significant cost and potential risk to our client. Um, and we just can't seem to get the people we need or the person we need to just say, yes, that's fine, crack on with it. What do you mean the council misses out, misses out on? Well, it's, it's to do with... Oh, the client misses out. Pardon? The client misses out. No, the council, council. Misses out on... Okay. We're talking about um, some development contributions and the council can levy those either at... 224C on a subdivision, but also has a number of other opportunities within which they can levy those. Um, and so if, for whatever reason, the agreement which we are comfortable with and, and thought we had worked out falls over, then the development contributions can still be levied at another stage. So the council would recover that. And so we can't understand why we're still waiting for the agreement to let us progress. Can I just ask how many, ballpark figure, how many of your clients' consent applications get denied? Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. This, this isn't a question about resource consents. Um, I think, generally speaking, I mean, the resource consents its own process, um, and I wouldn't. So, what are the other hand? What what else makes up this handbrake if it's not the consent process that you've acknowledged isn't a council process? Um, I think it's perhaps what can be done outside of the statutory processes to help facilitate um, businesses, development and even community groups from um, achieving what they would like to achieve. Um, I had another experience, similar experience um, in my position as a trustee of the Dunedin Tunnels um, Trust and we spent many, many hours, and I think Councillor Wilson will be able to attest to this, discussing various, various issues related to opening, um, in particular the Cavisham Tunnel and um, the risk adversity of uh, council staff in relation to issues that from our perspective seemed definitely solvable um, has meant that really nothing has happened in respect of that particular project. And, and that's the kind of issue that I'm, I'm talking about in response to Councillor Stain's questions. I think there needs to be a, um, a change in the mentality, I suppose, to try and work with people to solve problems rather than simply just saying, well, there's one. So a steady as she goes council approach with a less risk averse staff? 
I don't necessarily think less risk averse staff, but staff who are um, more um, adaptable, more, um, I suppose, confident in searching for <coughs> solutions to problems that, that arise. And I'm not saying that you should just carry on and just develop whatever or do whatever and have no regard for anything. Good. But you know, where there are problems that are identified, you want to be facilitating ways of overcoming those. Thank you. Councillor Thomas. You don't think that for every lawyer who's attempting to facilitate their client's path through a process, there's another lawyer gleefully rubbing their hands at the possibility that a, a shortcut might be taken? No, I don't think so, Richard. I don't think we would advocate that you do things that were illegal. <laughs> I wasn't suggesting for one moment that you would. <laughs> Councillor Wilson. No, no. Councillor McTavish. Well, my only question was, you'll be relieved to know you're still in the minority <laughs> um, in terms of young people submitting. And have you got any thoughts about what we can do to appeal more to your slash my demographic in terms of um, getting them involved in processes like this? Um, you can sit on it and get back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I suppose, you know, a lot of the issues that come up through these processes, like um, libraries are a good example, swimming pools and things like that, they perhaps don't impact on our day-to-day -day lives in the same way as they would for other people. And so I think um, the apathy is perhaps a, just due to a general lack of, I suppose, um, participation or, or understanding or, or need for a lot of the things that the council provides. Um, so I suspect that there will be plenty of out of age group that as they progress through their lives will contribute more. Um, yeah, I suppose look at the things that we participate in and then threaten not to fund them. <laughs> 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 Perversely novel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Kell. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> um, one of the things that people have mentioned to me recently that they imagine might help is not only having a general idea of a red carpet approach to a big person who comes to town or something as a potential employer and things, but to change our structure slightly to have something that some older people seem to think we had in the past, which was a sort of a chief planner role, and it's not that we don't have planners, and, and there's doubtless somebody who is sort of effectively the chief planner, but the role of somebody who we used to have, who was actually in charge of things, so when things got bogged down a bit, or something, they were a senior enough person to say, this is getting bogged down, let's get into it and get, get it sorted. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as being a useful sort of role to return to having? Um, yeah, I suppose you're talking, you're talking like a facilitator type role, perhaps. I don't necessarily think that there isn't that available now. Um, I think in terms of planning, um, if you face a particular issue, the likes of Alan Worthington or, or John Saul are um, available to you. Um, I suppose it's, it's actually, the, I suppose, their frame of mind, I think, which we find more challenging than necessarily having access to the right people. Um, and that's, again, around that idea of, of hunting for solutions rather than simply identifying problems. Well, some of our staff get caught between a rock and a hard place because we hassle them because they come up with their own solutions. Yes. And, then, and then people get cross because... They say, what is your staff doing saying yes or no to that? And then we start intervening again. So they're sort of caught either way. If they have dis Some days we don't want them to have discretion and some days we do. It's just having a senior person who had the experience that you could let have a discretion rather than the people at the 
further down who might. Yeah, I suppose um, <coughs> certainly none of those discussions in relation to resource management consents, whatever, you, you couldn't expect that person to be able to say, well, yes, you can just do that. Um, there is always going to be the process that needs to be gone through. Um, but it's perhaps having a, a more supportive um, approach to, to finding ways of answering the questions that, that will inevitably come up when you get into that regulatory environment where um, you know, what the councillors might take to start is actually as relevant as um, what we might have spoken about with them prior to actually getting into the hearing room. So, yeah, I, th I think it's just a, being able to have more upfront, more um, useful discussions with the council um, upfront, um, that would be of most benefit. Councillor Thompson. When, when you, um, have a, you describe the situation like you're expecting a decision on Friday but you haven't heard, is, would, it, would it be standard practice to be contacted and, and have an explanation or, or is that not standard practice and what difference would that make? Well, I've been following up every day. Right. <laughs> um, I'm not, yeah, but, I mean... I suppose my question is more, are, are you aware of what the problem might be or is because if you're unaware, I imagine the frustration then becomes quite high. Yes, yeah. Um, it's a bit of both at the moment. And certainly, um, if, if we didn't know, then, then there would be a higher level of frustration than there already is. Um, and I think yeah, communication is very important in those kinds of circumstances. Um, because at least if, if we understand what the problem is that the council is trying to solve, um, then we can look to try and feed into that in a way to help resolve that um, more quickly. I mean, you'd hope that um, the more minds you get onto it, the better. Um, no further questions. Can I just conclude by suggesting that if in this particular process you feel that the way you've been treated is unreasonable, then send the details to either myself or the Chief Executive and it would be fed down that day. Um, Neil Ballantyne. Welcome, Neil. Thank you, Mayor Cole and councillors for having me here today. Um, has everyone got documents in front of us? Sweet. We've, we've, and so, we've got your submission and everyone treated as read. Sweet. Fantastic. Uh, and That's speak correct. to it so you can add value rather than... That's correct. So I work for the Otago University Students Association and I'm there full-time as their Queer Support Coordinator. Um, and so as you would have read the draft and end strategy that you have before you, we use queer as an inclusive term of all forms of sexuality, sex and gender identity. So it includes lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, asexual, so on and so forth. And it's a reclaimed word. Um, just highlighting that for any people who have historical angst with the use of the word queer. And so within my role, um, I guess I see some of the best and worst that our society has to offer in regards to how we treat our people. Um, I see people who come out to their parents and get kicked out of home. Uh, today I was at a local high school and I was told by the guidance counsellor that, that one of the pupils was recently outed on Facebook and got beaten up the next day at school. Um, I hear constantly um, of uh, people being discriminated against in a whole range of areas across our city. And so as my work within uh, my current role and within conversations I've had uh, across our city uh, with people from the DHB and from a, a range of community organisations, that we decided it would be a good idea to put together a hui. And hence last year we had uh, a inaugural um, Dunedin Diversity hui. We brought together 50 people uh, who work in the community and who work with queer people um, to have a conversation about ways forward. And that's where, of course, this strategy came out of. And thank you, Mia Cole, for coming along and, and wrapping up that hui for us. It was, it was great. And so, yes, this draft strategy, which you should have, um, 
sort of sets out, um, I guess, the content that we received from that hui. So it was essentially that hui was a formal consultation, and all those ideas we have now fed into this draft strategy document. Um, and you'll see that it's framed around um, sort of key areas of work that we need to do in order to make our city as queer friendly as possible. And I think that's something we really should be aspiring for. We should be having a city where we do aspire to have um, a celebration um, of diversity. And yet when I read the, the draft, uh, the wellbeing strategy that we have, um, I didn't see the word uh, queer or LGBT or lesbian, gay, bisexual or sexuality, sex or gender identity anywhere within it. And perhaps that's our fault as a community for not getting involved in that process. Um, but it's also what has prompted as well this document. And so hopefully this document is something that the council can see as a strategy that could be adopted in some way um, within, uh, within the council. I see it um, sort of like uh, perhaps the um, young people's strategy, um, which is seen as, I guess, sort of a sub-strategy within the wellbeing strategy, and that might work to complement um, those other strategies which um, are out there. And so I think one of the neat things that we've come up with is a charter for the city. It's a draft charter saw at this stage, which is your very last page um, of the strategy. And I think this would be awesome to have as a city, a very simple charter that the council perhaps initially can commit to, and then other um, organisations throughout the city, like, like um, for example, the, the university or the polytech or the hospital or major uh, businesses like cabaries uh, could commit to. It's got very six very simple points, um, which yeah, we've got as a draft sort of provisions for that. And that would then allow for um, further training to go on um, and education, um, because I think when people are educated about people's identities, when people hear people's stories, that's when a lot of that, um, that negative stuff that happens um, just gets eliminated. And so that's what we're hoping to happen. Um, we're putting together a working group, um, again from the hui, of people who are committed to this process and at the moment that involves people from the likes of Otago Youth Wellness, PFLAG, CADS, South Trans NZ, um, Student Health, Family Planning, um, Community College, um, DCC already, Purple Passions and PAT. Um, and as such we've also applied for some funding through the Civics Grant. And now, really, that application was just to start a conversation. Um, it was a fairly arbitrary amount that we put in there um, because we really want to start a conversation with council and perhaps other funders around how we can find someone uh, or find some funding to employ someone to help us do this work. So, <laughs> my job at, is university based, but I'm constantly getting requests from outside of university to do my work. So, I'm constantly having requests from the likes of high schools, the likes of community organisations to go in and do trainings with them. Uh, to um, do professional development for their staff um, as well as provide partial care and access to service and that kind of thing. And so easily my job is becoming more than full time and again that would be um, well supported by the likes of a city-wide uh, career support coordinator. And so again that application for that civics grant um, was to start that conversation to see if that's something that could be within uh, our current staff here at council. Um, or if it, whether it's not, it's a better place to have our working group form some sort of trust and then gain funding from various places and become an employer, or whether there's another existing organisation out there in the community that could employ someone in this role and that we could find funding from various avenues. And so again, yeah, so that's to start the conversation. And I do have two letters of support currently as well, but obviously we have support overall because the diversity who are those 50 people that were represented there, um, that was direct consultation feedback from there. Um, so I'll leave it there because I, I think you'll probably have quite a few questions. So. Well, um, I'll kick off questions. I'm interested in how you see the charter working. And you mentioned um, linking up or, or, or getting buy-in from institutions like the University or the Polytechnic or, mm -hmm. or then businesses. Mm -hmm. You'll be aware of the model that we have for economic development strategy where from day one it was developed by and bought into by a range of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Is that... The, are you, so which, which are you, how do you see this going? I mean, do you see council needing to lead this or do you see this as more citywide from the beginning? I think it should be a yes and model. I think um, council and community should always work in partnership on these kinds of things. Um, and I see uh, DCC having an incredible role as uh, showing leadership to the rest of the community on this. For council to commit to this and say that we are going to correct and help correct um, you know, New Zealand's most queer friendly city, for example, um, perhaps from an economic point of view, you know, chase the pink dollar. 
um, <laughs> then uh, other, obviously other organisations would then be much more likely to leap on board. Um, so it's, it's got to be a yes and, I believe. Okay. Questions? Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Ronil, and um, thanks for your work on the, the HUI last year, and, and thanks for turning it into something. Um, it's great when something like that doesn't turn into a, a talk fest, and it's great to see that, that work um, crystallised in the submission, which is uh, very thorough um, and <laughs> ambitious, and I thank you for that, <laughs> and I expect nothing less. Um, you say that the 75k figure is essentially arbitrary. Realistically, though, if, if we were to, and whether the money comes from us and the university and OUSA or DHB or wherever, yeah. what kind of figure can we realistically be expecting someone to work full time on this for us? Mm. So, I mean, I just sort of went into my head and right. thought professional person on, say, around 50k a year plus 25 of expenses to create resources, to have some travel funding, to, you know, do that liaising work and that kind of thing, office expenses, that kind of stuff. Mm. For me, that just kind of quickly dialed up to 75k, which is where that fund, uh, that, that number came from. Um, Are there national examples that we can draw from in terms of either funding or operational models? Um, unfortunately not. Um, so bigger cities um, have different models. The likes of the super city in Auckland um, have someone within council staff whose um, task is one of their portfolios is to work on this. Um, but then they have other massive organisations like Rainbow Youth who employ multiple staff um, as a, an actual you know, community organisation to go out and do this work. Um, so in Dunedin, obviously all we have is me, so <laughs> I'm sort of a bit stretched. Um, what would, I'm finding it hard because this seems very, in your own mind, fully formed as a strategy in and of itself. Um, and it would be a shame to then go back to the beginning of, of this work. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what the governance model or the operational model looks like, mm -hmm. what, what are the first things, like what do you see as the primary, the first goal of this work? Yeah, so... <laughs> We didn't want to um, probably put those goals into hierarchy. We believe that was the work of the working group once we form that, and that's going to be formed at the end of this month. Um, and that would be believable. The first task will be to um, finalise the strategy, so it goes from draft to actual, and we've got some money um, already raised to make it pretty. So that's cool. Um, and then, as you'll see, there's a whole bunch of goals. Um, must be about, about 2025 um, in there as a sort of overarching goals, and each of them is then broken down with a um, a, a box for a like, time frame, and so that's we believe is the task of the working group, not for us, um, just as the organisers of the HUI essentially to, mm. to develop. And has that working group been assembled? Uh, yeah, it's currently assembled. So we've got the list of people uh, who have committed to it, um, but we have yet to actually um, have a meeting. Yet. All very busy people, but all committed to the process still. Great, thank you. Councillor McTavish. Neil, I've got a question. You, um, I mean, for clear and obvious reasons, the, the way that you have gone about doing this is specifically for the LGBT mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, diversity more generally, mm -hmm. there's obviously a piece of work there um, for, for a whole range of groups mm -hmm. that, uh, for whatever reason, feel like a minority in our community or feel that we're not welcome in our community. Um, from the from a governance perspective from this end and looking at our um, social wellbeing strategy um, and our current ridiculous financial constraints, <laughs> um, it would probably feel more possible to fund something that was that had a broader scope that, that looked at diversity through a um, broader lens. Now I appreciate that that's not what this proposal is and I, that's in no way uh, meant to be undermining the quality of this work or the, the need for this. Um, but I just wondered whether you had considered or whether you, you feel that there would be any room to expand the, the concept of diversity charter to something that was um, serving um, a broader community or, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, so obviously definitely our perspective is um, from a coming from a press perspective and, and seeing that as our specific issue. Um, obviously there are other issues out there. Um, to some extent that's already been covered by councils, so say sort of youth work for example, it's already been covered quite well. 
Um, I believe um, various cultural groups have good relationships with council already and work quite closely with council on a whole range of processes. Um, and so, yeah, so our focus is definitely this, which we don't believe council's really covering at all. We think it's quite a new area, essentially, for council. Still, a, we're, we're a very significant group. Um, statistics would show us at around 10% of general population. So, you know, that's very significant. So, obviously, um, there's a good argument there for some funding specifically for the queer community. But I do recognise the funding constraints, obviously, that are out there as well. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's a definite business case for what we have to do. And of course, you know, this is important stuff. This is, this is people's lives, we're being directly affected by it. Um, new statistics show us that there's between four and five times higher suicidality rate in queer young people as opposed to straight young people. So I hate to put it this way as like a fright thing, but people's lives are literally on the line when it comes to this. At the moment, our support services for queer young people in Janine are deficient. In that context, have you had discussions with Public Health South? Yes. Or and so one of our letters of support is from Public Health South, uh, Southern District Health Board, sorry. Yep. Um, and so we're working closely with Alex Massey there. His tat, uh, hat title is Sexual Health Advisor, so um, it's not yeah, it's not queer specific, but um, they're definitely on board. Um, and you can, I don't know, do I table this letter or? Just had it recently. Um, you can, yes, oh. you can give it to Jenny. Yeah. We'll another one. Um, and I guess does his um, enthusiasm <laughs> extend to funding or potential funding or um Again, I think if the DCC took some leadership role on this, then the BHP would get on board and say yes, let's see how we can work together on it. Thank you. Councillor Kelp. Last and answer, please. Oh, oh, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Neil. Oh, Murray. Thank you. I have uh, three submissions tonight. Um, perhaps you just clarify which one you have in front of you first. Make sure we talk about the right one. Start. A unitary council fund for the Sorry? Unitary councils? Yes. Unitary councils? Sorry? Unitary, unitary, unitary councils? Yes. We'll start unitary with council reserves contributions. We'll, we'll start with unitary councils then. I don't have any new information, but I'd like to um, just verbally speak to that, um, that topic. Uh, I submit that the DCC allocate funds to further the investigations of creating one unified council encompassing ORC and DCC. Um, my prime drivers for this idea are um, integrating a practical working relationship with the DCC and the regional services. It's an opportunity for better communications between organisations and the community. The Otago Regional Division um, would be able to leverage off a superior DCC service delivery. Um, some of these ideas come from my own experiences um, that I've had with Otago Regional Council and City Council as well. I think it would remove poor front office services from the ORC and enable better care of all ratepayers and customers. It would remove future narrow and inconsistent thinking around how to charge rates for the Leith and Lindsay Creek flood schemes. Um, once again, personal experiences, inconsistency and not very logical in the way that they have um, uh, charged ratepayers uh, in those regions. For example, um, if you drive past my property um, in Woodhall Street, um, should you pay some rates for having the privilege of driving through an area where there's um, an opportunity to have a flood. Um, I think you would drive past, but you wouldn't think about the fact that I'm paying higher rates to make sure that that area is flood free. <clears throat> I think it would remove the confusion around who is responsible uh, for what parts of Otago and stop both organisations passing the buck to each other when in the end someone has to be responsible. Um, situations have arisen where you go to one one council and they say, no, we'll have a look at that. Um, you don't hear back and, um, and then you find it's gone to another council and um, you end up with, um, it's not my responsibility, etc, etc. Um, costing. Definitely an opportunity to reduce uh, overheads and governance costs. 
uh, due to the joint use of shared services in one organisation only. Um, total costs of the ORC would be in the region of 615000 um, for audit 321, director's fees 294. I mean, there would have to be some savings in, in governance costs. Rationalisation of building use. For me, the end game would be minimising ratepayer costs. More transparency around ORC activities and bring into line with the DCC better frontline customer service, which I've already mentioned. The City Council has much better online tools, and I think um, the ORC could leverage off that and produce much better services. Uh, most of all, removing the silo mentality and waste in our smaller target population. We can't afford the duplication of services in a region of our size with such a small population. It was noted in the ODT on Saturday the 3rd of May, an interview with Grant McKenzie, that the new group role for DCC owned companies had suffered from a silo based approach to financial management. Hopefully you've all read the newspaper. DCC and ORC, um, they need to be strategically grouped. No doubt Mr McKenzie could add value to the insurance cost of the ORC infrastructure while negotiating on behalf of the DCC at Lloyds of London. Port Otago and Charles Property, two significant businesses that could benefit from closer collaboration with other DCC owned companies. For example, other unitary councils in New Zealand are Auckland Super, Super Council formed by the merging the Auckland Regional Council uh, with other city and district councils, you know about that story. Gisborne, um, covering most of the East Cape, Nelson, Tasman and Marlborough. Those councils have merged. So I believe this is an opportunity worth serious consideration to show Otago as progressive. My recommendation is the budget for the feasibility work remote unitary council. There are just too many good reasons why unitary council is best for our region. And I guess um, we're a very small regional population with a very, very large geographic area. I think we are, we are stronger if we are not divided, but we, we don't work in silos. And I really believe that um, this council should put some funding uh, aside to look at that that option. Thank you. Um, I'll kick off the questions. Have what were Dunedin, the Dunedin area to be a unitary council? What would you envisage would happen to the areas currently under the jurisdiction of the regional council, include the Central Otago District, Queenstown Lakes and Waitaki? Yep. Um, quite frankly I think it needs a lot of strategic um, thought and process around how you actually um, make that whole operation work. I don't have the detail. Um, I couldn't give you an answer to that. But um, I, I guess it's some, one of those it's one of those uh, projects that you need to put some effort <coughs> and cost aside to work out how that. Now, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is, do you envisage to need being the regional council for all that area, yes, or, do you, or do you envisage? the regional council, in a sense, retrenching to those areas and we're a unitary here. No, unitary here. Unitary yes. here and be, the regional council then would remain with jurisdiction in those other areas. So somebody has to lead. Yeah, no, but I'm, I'm just trying to clarify what it is you're promoting. Because the, if, if Dunedin weren't a unitary council over the whole province, then a, a regional council would remain. Is that what you're advocating? I, I don't advocate that. So, the region, the unitary you're talking about is the whole of the target. Correct. So there'd only be one council. Correct. Oh, I see. Thank you. Any other questions? You've asked mine. Oh, that was your question. <laughs> well, just just on that issue, um, it's certainly a, it's a big elephant in the room, um, but are you aware that at the time of the uh, local government reorganisation, which is the one that we currently have, exactly that proposal was floated by the city and the only authority that wouldn't agree to it was Queenstown. Did, is that common knowledge or not? Uh, I wasn't aware of that, I know. Further questions? Thank you, Mr Lawrence. Appreciate your submission. Okay, my next submission is 
I can't do it more than five minutes for each one, actually. But, well, um, well uh, you had five minutes. So you, do you have a, a separate submission? Or I have separate submissions. I had three submitted. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm sorry, you had five minutes for your submission. For, for, no, sorry, I have three submissions. I get five minutes per submission. No, no, no. We did not, no. no. You, you, had one, you had one submission time, I'm sorry, we have other people lining up to use the time. Um, yeah, well I've actually got three, three emails from uh, your Minute Secretary saying, you know, this is, these are submissions I put in. But I did it online, so three online submissions. They're, they're, all, under, they're, they're all under one submission here, and I'm, I apologise if that happened, but we've only allowed enough time, and if we gave you more time now, there are other people who won't get heard tonight, and they're here. Have we got copies of the other ones? We've only got one. They're all in here. We've got reserves, contributions, and housing stock. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I've only done one third of my submission. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Right. Um, we've read all of your submissions. Thank you. And um, mm -hmm. thank you. You've got the most important one, actually. Right. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, Dominic Tay. Dunedin Youth Orchestra. Welcome, Dominic. Uh, thank you very much. I'd just like to ask um, a question before I begin. I noticed in the schedule I've been assigned five minutes, but I am speaking on behalf of an organisation. You, you, you have ten minutes. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, so good evening, councillors. Um, it is my pleasure to speak to you on behalf of the Youth Orchestra. Um, for those of you who I haven't yet met, I'm Dominic Tay. I am both a member of the orchestra and the chairman of the committee uh, which runs it. Um, so tonight I want to talk to you about the orchestra and about what we do and about why our orchestra is important to the city of Dunedin. Um, we have applied for a separate grant of up to, up to $10,000 um, and I'd like to explain why, why this grant will help um, our orchestra. So for those of you who uh, don't know us, we have been operating as an orchestra in Dunedin for over 40 years now and the core function of the orchestra is to provide the most talented local under 25 year old orchestral musicians with a high quality musical outlet and opportunities for further development. We audition prospective members at the beginning of each year and these members must meet very high standards of our audition panel if they are to join. Now we currently have 65 members which is an increase on previous years and that shows the increasing popularity and importance of the orchestra um, to our community. Now some members of the orchestra are high school students whose musical talents exceed what is offered uh, at their school orchestras um, but the majority of the members of our orchestra study at the University of Otago and Otago Polytechnic. Now, you might be surprised to learn that most of these members are not actually music students, but they are students of dentistry, medicine, mathematics, biochemistry, um, geology, psychology, English, Spanish, early child education, and other ones that I can't list now because we have limited time. Um, so, so music is very important for these people, not, not for their career or occupation, but they do have a love for music, and we help them you know, extend that uh, while they can. Now we perform two concerts each year um, as an orchestra and the repertoire is made up from the broader orchestra repertoire as well as New Zealand compositions and local compositions from uh, particularly students at the University of Otago. Um, our concerts are well attended, they review favourably and we have a wide amount of support from the people of Dunedin. Now the next concert that we have is actually going to be in two and a half weeks. I have flyers if you'd like them. Um, so that's uh, Saturday the 24th of May at half past seven in Knox Church. Uh, if you want to see us in action, we would love to have you along. Now behind the organisation, behind the running of the orchestra, is a committee of volunteers, a mixture of parents and players, and this committee works extremely hard to ensure that our orchestra members have a place to share their passion for orchestral music. Now as with everything in life, there is a cost involved with this, and each concert that we put on costs upwards of $8,000. Now this is actually quite small by the standards of other orchestras like the Southern Sinfonia, um, small by the standards of the City Dunedin Choir. Um, but for a small non-profit organisation like ours, this kind of only takes considerable effort to find. Our modest income is limited to player subscriptions and ticket sales, both of which are kept quite low in order to encourage participation and attendance. So we must raise our funds from other sources. And back in the day we used to have national funding for all the youth orchestras in New Zealand from New Zealand Post and obviously that's not the case anymore and we currently survive uh, with grants from community organisations like Bendigo Valley, Otago Community Trust and the Lion Foundation. The problem is though and the reality is that these funding bodies to which we apply are providing fewer resources each year and sometimes this is up to 50% less than what we require to run the orchestra 
and our costs are ever increasing. So we are looking at new ways of raising funds and ways of reducing costs, um, but the fact is if we are unable to guarantee funds, then we are unable to guarantee the continuation of the orchestra, uh, and, and that is going to be a major loss for Dunedin. Now, the City Council has modelled its long-term plan around the vision that Dunedin is one of the world's greatest small cities, and we at the uh, Youth Orchestra believe that a lively arts community, including a local youth orchestra, is important for the Council to meet this goal. And the existence of such an orchestra in Dunedin actually fits into a number of Council strategies. So for example, we have the Social Wellbeing Strategy, which advocates for connected people living in vibrant and cohesive communities. So we are a training orchestra, and through this aspect of our, um, of, of our organisation, we are able to connect young musicians with opportunities and networks for their futures. Uh, as an example here, many of the members will go on to or already play in the Southern Symphonia. And we also connect the world of music with uh, members of the Dunedin public, who are, as I've said, thoroughly appreciative of our concerts. We keep the cost of our concert admission very low. Uh, in fact, all primary and intermediate aged children are free to attend, um, because we want to encourage the youngest members of our communities into the arts. Now, the social wellbeing strategy also looks at education, and of course, Dunedin is a great city of education, and being part of an orchestra provides a musical education that cannot be learned elsewhere. Philippa Harris, who is the general manager of the Symphonia, notes that youth orchestras provide young orchestral musicians the chance to develop skills that they could not acquire on their own or in private lessons, such as the ability to work as a team, working with their colleagues to ensure a coherent tone and style. And obviously, skills such as teamwork do have applications outside of an orchestra as well. Uh, but it goes without saying that within DYO, we are training the next generation of the Southern Symphonia. We are training the next generation of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, and we are training the next generation of orchestras overseas as well. And we've actually had um, two of our recent members who have gone on to musical careers in Europe uh, in the last 12 months, which is very exciting. And back home, our members share their knowledge with the generation of musicians below them through tuitions uh, both privately and through programs such as Saturday morning music classes. Now, the other major council strategy with which DYO aligns is, of course, the arts and culture strategy. Uh, but since this is in the process of being drafted, I can't really comment on what its contents may be. Um, we are looking forward to seeing the publication of this strategy later in the year, and we have worked uh, to, with, to, some, to some degree helping council develop this. And I would just like to stress that we would really like to see in this new strategy an allowance for funding applications for the general running costs of arts organisations. Um, now, because we've got the running of our orchestra down to a very fine arts, with auditions in February, concerts in May and September, uh, most of our expenditure falls under general running costs, and that actually prohibits our applications to funding pools like the Creative Communities Grants, which already exist, because these are for special projects, and we don't really have much room in our schedule for these special projects. So this previous strategy has let our organisation, the Youth Orchestra, fall between the cracks, and I know that the City of Dunedin would really appreciate this Council's assistance in helping pull the orchestra back out of those cracks. An arts and culture strategy that allows community groups such as ours to continue running like a well-oiled machine without needing to uh, differ from our schedule and put on special projects will guarantee this city's reputation as one of the world's greatest small cities for lovers of the arts. So if as I've explained here, the Youth Orchestra sits quite nicely within two of Council's strategies for the future and we are eligible for a civic grant. And a grant of up to $10,000, and again, I say, I say up to, um, we're not greedy, uh, a grant of up to $10,000 will help the orchestra by offsetting our running costs and reducing the amount of time that our committee spends applying for funding. And that'll allow us to ensure that we can put more effort into actually running the orchestra and providing new opportunities for our members and for our community uh, as well. So a civic grant will help the city also by ensuring that our local asset of the Dunedin Youth Orchestra is around for future generations of young musicians. Now I know that council funding is limited, and I know you know that as well, but the funding provided by a civic grant for the Youth Orchestra is not going to be wasted. I've provided some figures about um, the running of the orchestra, and you will see by looking at our recent financial statements uh, and our 
budget for the first semester this year. We are very interested in cutting our own costs to remain a financially viable organisation. Um, while I've been the chairperson over the past three years now, we have changed our concert venue, our printing supplier and our advertising methods to ensure that our costs can be cut, but we can still provide the same service and products for a fraction of the price. So we're doing what we can to ensure that our orchestra can continue within a tight economic frame, and your help in doing this would, would be so much appreciated. So council funding of any amount would be gratefully received. We would put it to good use, maintaining Dunedin's position as a vibrant and creative city with cultural, educational, and enjoyable opportunities for talented young orchestral musicians, as well as the wider community of supportive um, cultural appreciators. So I encourage you all to support our civic, app, civic right application for the Dunedin Youth Orchestra. Thank you so much for your time on this late evening, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Dominic. Councillor Lord. How are you doing, Dominic? I just can't help notice here it says in the 2013 year we gave you 2,200, no, yeah, 2,211. Was there any reason why that was sort Yes, of, that's right. Um, that so specific? last year we did have a special project that we were working towards, which was actually a combined concert with the Auckland Youth Orchestra. Um, so the AYO was doing a travelling tour through the South Island. We were their first stop. And because we are the only major youth orchestra um, in the southern part of the South Island, we had a combined concert in the town hall. We were able to apply for special funding for that, but we can't do that on a regular basis. Councillor Hall. Thank you, and thanks Dominic um, for coming and speaking to us. Um, this doesn't include your 2014 uh, forecast, so we've only got previous years to go on, but last year total grants are roughly 17k, um, the up to $10,000 that you're seeking from Council would essentially be that same, we're talking that kind of ballpark figure to stay solvent in 2014, around 17. Um, yeah, well we, I actually did submit a draft budget for our first concert, which I hope you've got, and I can give you a copy if you don't have it. No, no, I haven't. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, I can confirm that since we put in this application, we have received, well, we have heard back from one of the, um, the Lion Foundation, which we hadn't heard back from, it was pending when I put this application in. Um, we re only received $4,000 from, from them. We're very grateful for that, but we are anticipating a shortfall this semester, we're anticipating a shortfall next semester also, um, so we're really hoping that Council is able to uh, help tide us over uh, with regard to that. You mentioned creative communities, but where, um, if, if anywhere, does the Youth Orchestra um, circuit fit into CNZ's broader funding models? I know that symphonies and orchestras are politically reasonably contentious within CNZ at the moment but I don't, and I don't know whether you're caught up in that or not but are there any opportunities for creative New Zealand funding or no? I don't believe so. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further questions? Yeah. Councillor Bazette. Yeah. Um, Thank you for coming along, uh, Dominic. It's good to see you're still advocating for the youth orchestra. You've been doing it for a number of years now. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, if you did get up to ten thousand um, dollars, I mean, what what difference does that really make to the orchestra? I mean, would there be extra tutoring, or d would that just go? I see you've got funds sitting in the national bank term deposit. Um, what, what would where would the where would the funds be applied? Okay, so with, what with, would be what yep. would be the difference? If, if you didn't get the funds. Yep. Um, with, with regards to some of the money that we've got tied up in term deposits, we can't use some of this for our running costs because uh, some of it is a donation from another charitable organisation which has been specified to be for a scholarship for orchestra members. So a lot of the money that you see, you, you, might, you might say, oh, they've got a lot of money there, um, but unfortunately that is tied up as, as a scholarship, so we're unable to use that um, to, to help keep the orchestra running. Uh, and I must confess I've forgotten the second part of your question well, there. Was, I was just wondering how you would apply the extra funds if you were to get them. Oh, right, um, okay. And I know there that you have tutoring uh, workshops and, and what have you. Would, that, would, that, would, would those sort of things be enhanced? Or? Well, I'd, I'd certainly like to think so. Um, we offer a weekend workshop once per semester. Um, if we could run that more often, that'd be great. Um, normally, we try and place it right in the middle of the semester, and these weekend workshops are good for two purposes. They're really good for helping the musicians get sort of get in gear, 
and, and learn the music, and they're also good for refining technique. But you can't necessarily do those things both at the same time. Um, so having two weekend workshops would be great if we, have, if we can get the money for it, one sort of a third of the way through the semester, and then secondly, again, a couple of weeks before the concert. Yeah, I just like to think that the funds were applied to something positive rather than, say, advertising or something like that. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Further questions? There are none. Dominic, thank you. Thank you very much, Council. Very spirited. Um, would, would you mind if I handed out some no, flyers? Absolutely. Please thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Sean, Hogan. Sean Hogan, Broad Bay School. Ten minutes Thank you. at your disposal now. You have the floor. Thank you, Council. And um, I'm hoping I'm almost the last person to you this evening. It's been an awful long session. The last person is fighting behind the pillow. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it can feel a bit more of an endurance race than a sprint, but you're almost at the end. And obviously this is the most important part and the bit that you really want to listen to. Um, but I'm not on my own tonight. Stone, who's the principal of Broadway School, and also someone who is here from the Portobello School Board of Trustees. Um, and I guess we're here because we're so very concerned about the reopening of submissions um, on the Peninsula Walkway. So what, what I'd like to do is I've just popped around some supplementary information, which will become clear as we go along. I thought I might quickly talk through some of the main features from my submission and talk around those and then proceed. So, Broad Bay School is a full primary, taking children from 5 to 13, and we're currently growing our role. We've recently got a third teacher. Um, the original proposal, way back in 2005, uh, we believe, set and set since that date, gave the school great hope that before many of our children grow up and move on to high school, they would actually get the benefits of, the, um, of, of safe access to Portobello. All of the children who go to our school either live in Broad Bay or on the road to Portobello, or in Portobello itself. <coughs> so the existing expectation for, for the school and for the Board of Trustees was that the council plan would be followed, and that over the 2015 to 2017 window, the Broad Bay settlement would be joined to Portobello. Uh, at that time, it seemed a long way away, but, but welcome, and we believed that, that it wasn't going to change. And we wanted it for our children, because we believed that increased access to the unique environment that we live in um, would, would just give increased opportunities for the children to fully experience that environment. Making that foreshore area more accessible and child friendly, giving a safe and secure place for the school children to use on their daily commute to school. Currently, effectively, the whole of the coastline, other than uh, a sandy beach area and a rocky beach area, is effectively closed off to the school, as it would be far too risky for children to use these areas, given there's no separation between cars and pedestrians and little or no walkable verge. It also obviously would give new opportunities for physical education, uh, which is an area that the school is really trying to work on. The other options that were put forward, um, to be honest, filled us with dismay. Option A would only join the settlement of Broadway to Portobello in 2023. Options B and C would see no substantive improvement in Broadway till about the same time. By which time our current oldest students, due to leave school next year, would be old enough to come back and teach in our school and our current newest pupils would have left and be well settled into high school. So for us, by changing the current plan, council would seem to be limiting access, safety and opportunity for an entire generation of broad-based school children. And that's, that's the guts of the, of the first submission that, that, that we made. Since then, I had a little bit of more time and a little bit more time to look at some of the figures that have been sent around by council. 
and that's created the, the supplementary submission. Councillors will have heard or are going to hear some real concerns from parts of our community in Broad Bay about the fact that the original plan was opened up again for resubmission at all. And then for a whole host of issues related to information provided by council to help inform and assist the public in making quite a difficult decision. You will or have heard concerns about the potentially incorrect use of census data um, to estimate community size along the Peninsula Road, which we feel overstates the size of the community along Section A around threefold. I'm sure that residents in Tomahawk and Ocean Grove will be amazed to know that they're logged as habitual users of the Peninsula Road. Also, we've seen multiple submissions where the person's intention has been confused by the choices presented. Um, so people who ticked the box for option A, but from their comments clearly wanted the current option, um, Surely the current option would be option A to see the world in that way. I can understand how that happened. And in what's finally over the weekend, you may have heard that there was a computer issue that invalidated 19 submissions. It was only identified by a member of the Broad Bay community reading through and noticing that certain submissions, instead of being for option A or option B, whatever, just had not applicable in them. Uh, this was brought to attention of, of council, and I believe they've resubmitted and, and redrafted that. Cumulatively, all of these factors have tested the forbearance and trust of those involved in the community. I decided to limit what I was going to say today to a single issue, which was road safety, which I've spent a little bit of time looking at. Because again, I, I feel that there's something to be said here. On initial examination of the council materials, it looked fairly clear. 4,500 movements in section A, creating 45 crashes over a five year period. Then in section C, Broad Bay to Portobello, 1,750 vehicle movements and 27 crashes. It had appeared that the total for the first section had more crashes of the same caliber than the Broad Bay section. Well, on a volume basis, maybe there was a little bit more of a risk of an accident in the Broad Bay to Portobello section. And that was part of my original submission. But look behind the figures and a different picture emerges. Resource consent application from council breaks down those crashes. The table of crash fees is attached in Appendix 1. And from that, and you have to do a tiny bit of adding up in this, Section 5 and 6 is the Vauxhall to Glen Fallick section. Section A, Vauxhall, had an unusually high number of non-injury crashes, about 24, uh, compared to Section C, Broad Bay. But these are usually discounted, and, and in fact, in the council models, these are discounted when assessing risk on the open road. Section A and Section C have rather more similar rates of minor crashes, 17 in the Vauxhall area and 13 in the Broad Bay area. Again, normally these are discounted um, for, for open road state highway risk factors. I'll come back to that. It's a little different in this case. With most analyses, the only thing you're really interested in are the serious crashes and obviously the fatal crashes. Fortunately, we had none of those. But here the difference is really very marked. Over the same period, Section C, Broad Bay to Portobello, suffered eight serious crashes double the number experienced by the first section of road. Of course, the real situation is far more concerning because of the big difference in volume. The Broad Bay to Portobello section had double the number of serious crashes on much less than half the volume of traffic. To put it in its most stark terms, on this data, the risk of suffering a serious crash on the Broad Bay to Portobello section is five times that of suffering a serious crash on section A. In presenting summary information, Council has, it seems to me, inadvertently obscured rather than clarified the accident data. Council did, however, make two, two additional measures available um, to help us assess risk. The first of those is the one that I wanted to really talk about. It's called collective risk. Um, you'll see at the very, very back page where we have the little printout that, that Council produced, it gives a definition of collective risk the number of injury crashes over a road section that could have resulted in either serious injury or fatality. Um, if you add up those, and this isn't difficult, it, we know that um, Section A had four serious and 17 minor crashes, giving a total of 21. Section C, Broad Bay to Portobello, had eight serious and 13 minor crashes, giving exactly the same total of 21. And yet the Vauxhall section was assessed as a, as a high risk, 
and the uh, broad base section are medium to high risk, which just makes no sense. I did ask for the methodology that was used, um, and I've said here that I didn't get anything back, and it's not true now. At 5.17 this evening, I got something back, uh, which was well after this had been published. Um, it was what I expected. They're using a different methodology from the one that is described in the, in the flyer. So when they say, if I get it right, collective safety risk, the number of injury crashes over a road section that could have resulted in either serious injury or a fatality. Actually what they've done is take those crashes, analyze them, look at how each crash happened, and try and project forward how many potential casualties may be caused in the future. And from that, create a variable, which is fine and valid. It's just not what they said they'd done, which is unfortunate. The final kicker is they also haven't added up the right number of crashes. It's been based on 20 crashes um, on the Broad Bay to Portobello section instead of 21. And that one difference in crash is probably why the risk levels are different. So to conclude, we're, we're rather worried that from the information that's been presented, people might easily have formed the view uh, that section A was the more dangerous piece of road. And my fear is exactly the reverse is the case. And I have to conclude that if a council is serious about preventing the most dangerous crashes with the greatest risk of serious injury or death, they must complete section C from Ball Bay to Portobello as a matter of urgency. The fact the area includes two schools and four other related child facilities, as well as being a route that we share with tourist coaches and trucks, makes this a real necessity. And finally, there was a plan. It was a good plan. It was carefully fashioned. It was all about communities and it was all about safety. And I'd ask that you please stick with the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, councillors? <coughs> Councillor Wilson. Um, we've had a number of submissions and I'm going to be consistent and ask you the same question about, I mean, this isn't necessarily a project about winners and losers. This is about a better um, thing for everyone on the peninsula and for Dunedin. And a number of submissions have suggested that actually we should just make this whole project a whole lot quicker. Now, at the moment, and any of you who are at the Portobello meeting, I said, well, you know, why, why not show some leadership and offer, as rate pays, and you can only vouch for yourselves on this, are you prepared to consider a higher targeted rate for the peninsula? Personally, Those... personally yes, I am. But I, I also thought about this question because you, you mentioned it at the meeting mm -hmm. out in Portobello. And what I thought was usually a targeted rate is used when there's a specific thing that everyone needs to pay for, like ooh, a stadium. Um, or when, contrarily, there's, there's something which is only going to benefit a tiny number of people, like a flood scheme. Uh, where just the properties that are affected are often targeted for a targeted rate. But what we're talking about here is essential safety works that are already planned, scheduled and budgeted um, with companion funding from central government. So the idea that that would be subject to a targeted rate, particularly given that it costs eight million for just one section of that road, uh, our section and our community size across both Broad Bay and Portobello is 1,100. I struggle with that. It's not a private road. The benefits of the improvement will be there, not for people on the peninsula only, but for everybody who uses that road. Every coach, every tour bus, every camper. So unless council is also suggesting making the whole road a toll road, or taxing the cruise ships, or any of the other things that, that, that would be used to raise funding, I think it would be difficult. No. Personally, I'd be happy to pay, because I'm very frightened by some of the figures that I've worked through. Um, I just don't think that it's workable, but that's well, and, and I think I'm looking at speeding it up the process, not necessarily paying for the whole thing. Yeah. And, and, and the other part I'll add to that is, um, I appreciate that that's a normal approach in the city. In other centres like uh, Central Otago, a lot of this stuff is done by targeted rates, and this may be the opening of this, dealing with things quite differently. So I'm, I'm just, and so in that light, could I understand from the other two members who are here, if they're happy to give their own personal views on that? Yes, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm happy to consider the targeted rate as a personal rate pair. Um, however, the diverse nature of uh, <coughs> students and families that come to Portobello School come from very low socioeconomic areas, and so, and especially given uh, that uh, consideration, I, I doubt that people will be able to afford that. I think I'd also say that um, are we not already paying? Uh, 
The, the whole purpose of rates is the provision and maintenance of uh, safe ways to allow our children, 150 in this case, to get to and from school. This is already provided for in the majority of communities actually in central Dunedin itself. If our schools were in central Dunedin, we wouldn't even have this conversation. So we're already, that we're already paying for the maintenance of those safe walkways within central Dunedin. And I think it's only reasonable that we should expect the same safe walkways for our children without being told to. And, and we've had the same submission from people who haven't got this even on a budget yet for their areas. Um, today, that if we looked at it evenly throughout the city, then you know, taking that argument further, is actually we would say let's get footpaths done in other areas and either put the rates up or spread out the work for longer. So that's the other risk that you've got is that we start putting footpaths around Brighton and Wardrinville and say actually all, all footpaths have to take longer to get. So I'm just trying to find a mechanism that um, can get this work done more quickly where the benefit lies, otherwise, the there may be other consequences. I'm being the devil's advocate. You'll appreciate that's my job to me. Councillor Thompson. Uh, well, one of the issues I'm interested in is um, what people will actually do regardless of um, when, where, where the work is done. And, and looking at, at the maps of Broad Bay, I'm trying to work out, this is not a challenge, it's a question, okay? I'm, I'm trying to work out, I look at um, where the houses are and I look at um, the notion by and large people take the shortest route um, and so going from, it seems to me anyway, going from the majority of houses, it's unlikely that many people are going to go effectively in, in many cases backtracking down to the main road and then along. They're going to continue to use, is it Roebuck Rise and I can't remember the other one along there. Yeah. The, roads are, the roads are complicated, I, I think, and having looked at them, I, I was looking, I looked on Google Maps a little earlier and sort of got a feel for what it looked like from there. And then I went down to Street View, and what you must remember is what's offered as the safe route for kids are the back roads. And the vast majority, in fact, all bar one of those back roads, doesn't have any um, any separation between cars yeah, and no, I'm not denying that for a moment and, yeah. I'm, and I'm not I'm oh, not denying sorry. the the yeah. unsuitability yeah. of those roads what I'm what I'm trying to understand is what I'm trying to get a sense of what will people actually do are they going to continue to use those routes which I have a suspicion that that's what human nature will drive them to do um, as opposed to can, having to use those roads anyway but to go in a different direction to take a longer route I think it will be a range, and it depends where they live. For some of them, what would make an awful lot more sense would be to go down to the front to walk along the safe area and come back over. Uh, that's for people that basically at both ends of town. I think people who live at the top of the street with the, with the school on them just around the corner, they'll just walk down, and that, that would just make sense. But what you'd see is, one of the things that adds to the risk around the school is, of course, the cars coming from further up the road and from the bellows side where there is no alternative but to drive. By creating a safe walkway, you create an alternative, which means you actually reduce the road traffic, which makes those roads safer as soon as you get off the main road. It also makes the immediate environment of the school safer. So, so you get, you get, a, you get a, a number of advantages. Yeah. But the other thing is, at the moment, and this is what I was getting out with the serious crash information, all of those parents are driving their kids along a road that is, appears to be five times more dangerous than, um, than the other highest risk road along the peninsula. So by, by reducing the, the volume and the use of that road for that sort of local traffic, you actually might be reducing the risk as well. Plus the improvements of that road should reduce the crashes. Uh, so that's what I was thinking. Councillor Tench. Well, just to follow on from I, the, the, um, and having walked around those roads recently myself to get my head around the topography, I understand what you mean about them. Yeah. They're not quite what they look like on Google Maps. Yeah. Um, having said that, though, um, my understanding is that it's the intention of the construction to put it on the um, seeds or the harbour wind side of the, of the road. So for most parents that are going to be sending their kids to school, those kids would need to cross the, go down the hill, cross the main road, onto the other side, walk along, cross back, 
um, in a spot which isn't ideal for crossing in, in the Hida Greek Street. So I guess I, yeah, just testing that hypothesis. Again, it's, it's, about, it's about the way the transitions happen and, and how well an engineer them. And I think that will be partly for the community to be working with council and council planners to manage those transitions. Um, because, you know, the, it's interesting that, 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 that at the McCandry Bay end, they have been looking for a, a walking bus for quite some period of time. And they were told that those were not allowed because there's nowhere safe for the kids to walk. Put in the walkway, a walking bus with 30 kids immediately started. They have to cross the same road but you can manage that risk with good planning. Uh, and I believe the council can, can produce good plans for that section of road. Councillor Wiley. Thank you. Um, I don't know why I'm going to weigh in on the second to last uh, submitted, but uh, listening to this all day, one of the things that I've got to looking at is the ODT and the accidents that have taken place, especially when you put these figures in front of us. Now, I'm looking here from uh, Wednesday, the 14th of March 2012, and Neil Collins is talking about more barriers to stop cars going in. Doing some other searches, I see cars, driving error, conditions, things like that. Is the road going to be improved for that as such? or Because to me, the road is difficult and needs a lot of care, and most of it's driving error. It does. And I mean, how many crashes over, over all crashes are driver error? But roads can make something more or less dangerous. And what struck me is, uh, I, was, I was struck by one of the contractors who was describing how, as part of his normal work, he was unable to stay on his side of the road because of the extreme bends between Broadway and Portobello. And I found that quite powerful because in my head I'm thinking, OK, we've got a, a truckie who's doing his very best but actually can't stay on his side of the road. He meets a coach coming the other way. That's not a good combination. Um, I think anything that can be done and by making a road wider, by, by, by fashioning a slightly safer road, this is a road safety initiative. Um, if we can make that stretch of road wider and safer, we might just end up with less crashes. And that's really what this is all about. I don't think we'll ever eliminate them. And, and you know, on my analysis of it, by the number of crashes happen at night, when it's wet, all the things that you expect with increased risk. But nevertheless, there is this, this unfortunate cluster of crashes on that side of the road. Anybody who drives it will know that as soon as, almost as soon as you leave Ball Bay, those bends get tighter and tougher. Uh, and it's just a bigger chance of having an accident and actually hitting something coming the other way. Uh, plus, it's obviously, if you've got a walkway that goes out a little further, perhaps a few less people will end up getting their feet wet on the way to work because there'll be a more forgiving road with an extra metre, two metres, three metres of land before they hit water. Do you think that having the road will be that wide enough that even a bus and a truck meeting will be safely it's, passing those. It's, you know, I, I think it's never going to be as straightforward a road as some. But I think what we're looking at is what changes can be made to make it safer. And of course you've got the advantage on the plans that are being put before you that you're separating out pedestrians and cyclists who currently are sharing that tight space with those other groups. Um, so for me it's... it's it's easy, but then, you know, I live there. But, but honestly, when I was going through looking at the crash statistics, I, I did become very concerned. Okay, I applaud your passion for this. Yeah. Looks like the questions. Thank you very much for your submission. Cheers. Um, very detailed and very well thought through. Thank you. Thank you. Well, children are lucky to have somebody who's got that level of detail in their midst. It's a long Brian Dixon. Brian, you're the lucky last. Yeah, sorry for you. <laughs> now, are you, Brian, are you representing yourself or? I am in this case. Right. Yep. yep. So, and you're asking that because I'm a member of a number of organisations who could have represented my guess. Well, well, now that you've acknowledged that, you've got five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got some background information that sort of supported of my submission, um, which um, yeah, my submission. You, uh, 
Councillor Benson Pope talked about the elephant in the room before, and I think the biggest elephant in this room at the moment is the issue of climate change. The IPCC report um, recently released, just since, since my submission, highlights that uh, and, and proposes a number of things that, uh, that regions need to do. Uh, government has, has abrogated that responsibility, said that um, that's really your responsibility to deal with. Uh, I have more copies to do. Um, and so, so that means that really it's, you know, it, it's councils like yours that have to be thinking about what, what the issues are. Um, so the actions that the IPCC refers to uh, really say that at the moment, if you're an investor um, or entrepreneur, you should be putting your money in the clean energy sector. We can't afford to waste time and energy in the pursuit of fossil fuels that are now quite unlikely to be uh, given uh, to be viable given the high cost uh, in terms of carbon loading of that fuel uh, and energy use. Our city has emerging opportunities to benefit from technologies and employment associated with a more positive future, but only if the leaders now make those decisions to move in that direction. Uh, and I realise that the plan doesn't specifically address these issues. I know that there's an energy plan in place that is meant to be addressing these issues, and I know that there are committees that have been formed in the past um, which address aspects of these issues. Um, but right now, um, I'm actually urging that you establish a new body that has the power and the authority to investigate, plan and implement, and then monitor in innovative projects around reducing the impact of climate change, and I refer to a couple of those uh, in, in my main submission. That body needs to be able to avoid the red tape uh, and involve representatives across all sectors like council, uh, university business, all of our communities uh, and the public sector where they have a collective, uh, a cooperative mandate from their agencies to be involved in that decision making uh, and actual authority to be involved in decisions. Uh, while your energy plan envisages some relevant actions, now is the time for even more decisive changes and uh, in, in my oral summary, summary of the oral submission, I've actually set out some of those um, so that I'm actually offering some specifics. So in terms of the energy conservation measures, uh, there's the suggestion of um, urgent review of your street lighting, uh, looking at the energy efficient alternatives, uh, looking at light spill, and in my main submission I talk about Tekapo as, as a good example of where that's been done very effectively with benefits for tourism in terms of visibility of the night sky. Um, and also uh, looking at public lighting of facilities. I was at Culling Park this evening and noticed that um, all of the lights were blazing there. Uh, an hour after everybody had, anybody on that park had left, and from having gone home past there from time to time, I can guarantee those are probably still burning now and probably till nine o'clock. Uh, and that's, that's just a ridiculous uh, use of, of, of our energy uh, resource and the budget of this council. Um, I'm suggesting that we look at low fee um, or zero, zero interest loans um, in terms of home insulation, because that would actually be an investment, because over the next five years, technologies actually the technologies in that area are going to become more efficient and cheaper uh, as they have over the past five years. So that would be a value gain for council. Looking at energy projects, there are a number of things that council should be investing in, facilitating um, clean technology and renewable energy production, research, um, looking at proven technologies, but also encouraging uh, city-based projects into developing new clean technologies, uh, and I've listed some of those. Encouraging business uh, and council to look at co-generation, a lot of heat generated in this uh, room here, uh, which, you know, and, and heat can be injected back in for, uh, for use elsewhere, uh, or, or as energy into the grid. Um, looking at encouraging the Neiden-based industries for solar energy systems, wind turbines, solar water heating, uh, and actually getting involved in community-based projects alongside the university uh, would make a lot of sense. 
I've referred to the forest resource and, and what I see is an, an unbelievable waste there of sending unprocessed logs offshore uh, and that's something that Council may have some ability to influence. A number of benefits from these are good local jobs, uh, use of available expertise, investment in the city including probably ethical use of the Paipuri Fund, uh, it couldn't be used in a better way I would suggest. Um, being part of the global energy technology shift, looking at extensive and growing markets, um, broad sustainability criteria being met and uh, substantial tourism potential, as well as increased self-sufficiency for residents in the city. Uh, the other items I've put in there include something from, from the most unlikely source I could expect it last month, just after I'd made the submission. Uh, <laughs> no, no advertisement for Air New Zealand. Um, but they do have a, a and, and also BNZ, <laughs> who, who have put in this feature article on in, uh, pine-based wood uh, processing in, in uh, Nelson uh, that's been in place for 35 years, a very strong sustainable use of forest resources where they use every component uh, of their forests. Um, because I'm aware that some people around this table still have the view that, uh, that we should be like Taranaki, I've actually put in a summary of uh, something I wrote last year um, about why we're not comparable to Taranaki, uh, and that, that would be worth reading because this, the situation where Taranaki was developed uh, with energy projects 30 years ago was a totally different uh, animal. Uh, it included uh, subsidies, uh, government subsidies and project uh, and industry subsidies that were invested back into the community. Uh, the other thing I've put in here is about, and it's from the industry itself, the petrochemical industry, one of the latest, it's just, just come off the press the 2nd of May, and that's why gas won't cut greenhouse gas emissions. Gas is not a substitute fuel, it's not a transitional fuel, and we need to look at the alternatives. I thank you very much for uh, your patience and the hard work, and to the staff and the media. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate your submission. Are there any questions? I think we're questioned now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Don't take it personally. There's plenty of night time reading. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you, councillors. Um,